Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. Great to have you with us on the opening drive on 101 ESPN. Brooke Grimsley, Super Bowl champion Kerry Davis. I'm Randy Carricker, and it is wonderful to be with you. It's 7 o'clock. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. I can't break our week back record that was set yesterday, so I won't even try, Brooke. <laughs> what do you think of that? You won't even try? Nope. There's going to be a morning someday where ESPN is going to mess up, and we're going to start at 6.59. It's the and only way I'll be able to break it. We'll be able to break it. You guys will be rearing to go, huh? We will. Like, I, I don't know. Will. Unless you like did it in like the intro music, like you just make it while the music's going on. Yeah, it's, it's like Goldie. News. If Goldie has had a bad back in the past, so yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll. If Goldie does it, will it'll be the first thing we say? Okay, I, I can't wait. <laughs> but it's always great to start a day with Rebecca Black. Matthew Rocchio is here. The Cardinals are winners once again. And uh, they don't need to add a pitcher for next for 2024. See, They're set. See, <laughs> see, They're set. And I just this is the this is where this is where the problems start mm -hmm. because it's this is what happens. Yep. Zach Thompson goes out, mm -hmm. gives you four innings and eight eight strikeouts. Uh -huh. Matthew Libertor goes out and gives you eight innings and seven strikeouts. And now as a pitch is like a number five. Uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. And now <laughs> you start to see the, the, the wheels spinning uh -huh. in the front office. Like, oh, we actually may not yeah. need to go spend extra yeah. money. We got <laughs> guys in house. And guys. so we can stay in the same place. Yeah. And then you're right back where you are in 2020. No, no, and no. And I said this to you guys right after Bo said that we're going to, we're, he basically said, we're not going to wave, wave the white flag, but we're going to wave the white flag. As soon as you wave the white flag, I said this, do not trust anything you see for the rest of this season. And that includes what you saw last night and what you saw Sunday afternoon. No, of course not. And you're happy for Matthew Libertor, right? Because happy, we knew very. it was going to be a huge pressure moment for him. So I am impressed because that, in my opinion, is a pressure moment because every Everybody always looks at that Randy Rose Arena, Matthew Libertor trade, and there's going to be that constant comparison where it's like, okay, well, we'll see who's getting the most value out mm -hmm. of this. And then you have Matthew Libertor with that performance last night. He looked confident, 101 pitches, eight strong innings. I was glad that they let him. Get to eight strong innings. Yeah, I mean, that's. Why, I, I know. Yeah. Why, I was. Why I was he surprised. Get that chance, but not Michael. Is. <laughs> <laughs> <Who the> funk <laughs> is. That's a fantastic question. But either way, you're happy for him because you want him yeah. to be successful, and he's only 23 years old. Right. Hopefully, he can build off of it. I just hope, like you guys were saying, I just hope they're like, well. All right. We got our starting rotation. Dakota's looking good. We got Matthew Libertor looking good. That's it, guys. Oh, yeah. hey, <laughs> you know what? They might be saying it this morning. Yeah, we, we got our five. We've got Michaelis, and we've got Matt, <laughs> and we've got Libertor, no and we've way. got Thompson, and we've got Hudson. Here we go. And then we've got Graceffo and McGreevy on the way. Woo, dog. Drew Rom. And, yeah. and, and therein yeah. lies the problem. because yep. the, the, and, and that is a realistic thing that could potentially yeah. happen. And Don't so, believe it. Don't be shocked if it does. No. I was literally, after like the fourth strikeout, the, the last like four, I, I laughed every time it happened because I was like, if you didn't see this coming, <laughs> you haven't been paying yeah. attention. Scoreless game in the fourth inning when Andrew Kisner continued his offensive rampage. First pitch swing, fly ball well hit left. A Rosarena sprinting to the track to the wall. That ball is gone. Kisner ambushed him. It's 2 nothing Cardinals. Who starts to catch your opening day next year, Kisner or Herrera? Oh. What about the guy that what, they what paid $87 Wilson, yeah. million? Dollars he will be like one of the highest paid bench players in the history of the Cardinals. Never. No. Not happening. Turn it. No way, no. In, no way in the world. Can I rephrase what you said? Yes. I think that Andrew Kisner will be the starting catcher. Maybe not for this organization. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> Just yeah. say, I don't want to see him go. But if we're talking about making some moves in the offseason, Andrew Kisner has definitely elevated his value. Yeah. Cardinals got a home run from Edmund. They wound up winning it by a score of 5-2. to two, Allowed a couple of runs in the ninth inning. Ho-Ho Romero uh, allowed a couple of runs. And Matthew Libertor, as we mentioned, was terrific. And the uptick in velocity helps a, a few things. Like that there. How about that 95 at the bottom of the zone? You'll take that all day. And that's going to be one of the biggest things for me in watching Matthew Libertor. He's got the good life on the fastball, but I want to see him be able to use it everywhere. And I like that, though. 95 up at the top of the zone. Swing and a miss. Libertor is finding the magic. That's three strikeouts, one in each inning so far. And he 
just struck out back to back hitters. Diaz has whipped twice. Libertor has four through three tonight. Another punch out there for Matthew Libertor. Gassing up again. <laughs> three two pitch. Is swung on and missed. Libertor is dealing six strikeouts through five innings. The story of this night is the man on the mound, Matthew Libertor, with a new career high in strikeouts. After a long first inning, he looks like a man reborn tonight. Eight innings for Libertor. He uh, threw eight shutout innings, allowed only two hits, didn't walk a batter, and struck out those seven. Andrew Kisner is the guy who caught him. I mean, he was untouchable tonight. I mean, that was about as good as you can pitch, but that's how he can pitch every night. And, um, you know, we talked before the game, and I told him, I said, dude, your stuff is elite. Just challenge these hitters. Do whatever you can. Challenge these guys. Get strike one. Go right after them. Trust your stuff. And he did that tonight. I mean, he was he was unhittable and, and mixing pitches. Can't say enough. That was outstanding. And oh, by the way, Libertor is spending a lot of the night, as Chip Carey said on Bally Sports, along with Brad Thompson, spent a lot of the evening at 95-96. Trainers and even Dusty and Ollie, um, I think it really kind of came to light tonight, and uh, you know I think that's uh, definitely a good spot to build off of. We, well, I told you this when when I watched him pitch in his first start against Milwaukee in person. It he has what it takes. Now, what took place from that start to last night? Maybe it was nerves. Maybe it was overthinking it. Maybe gripping the ball too tight. Maybe not trusting himself enough. But last night was a great performance from him, and and. If you can get those types of performances, if you have that type of talent and you can get those types of performances, you can be a very good Major League Baseball player for a long time. It's just the consistency. It's never, it's very rarely about the talent once you make it to the Major Leagues mm -hmm. or make it to the NFL or NBA. You, everyone has the talent. Do you have what's upstairs enough of it to make sure that you're able to do it every single day? And the best thing, the one thing I like to tell people and tell players is, okay, you had a great start. You know what your reward is for doing that? You get to go do it again. <laughs> That's the only reward. Mm -hmm. There is no, no plaque. There is no medal. There is no trophy that you're given. You get an opportunity to go show, hey, this is who I am. I get to do it again. And that's the, that's his reward. We'll see if he's able to do it his next outing. Yeah, and 26 pitches in that first inning as they were talking about there. But then he was able to settle in after that. Career highs and in innings pitch, strikeouts, didn't walk a batter, and he had 15 swing and misses. It was just, that was what Andrew Kisner was saying. He has elite stuff. We were able to see that on display. I think that, that was really important for the front office to see that he does has the have those capabilities and for everybody else to see it too. And I do have to keep reminding myself, he's just 20 three years old so like you're saying cd maybe it was some of those nerves of you know the pressure of knowing that they're really relying on him to possibly be competing for that fifth spot but he rose to the occasion last night and now he's just got to build off of it and tonight the cardinals are in kansas city they'll play three against the royals over the course of the weekend other things that have happened over the course of the last 24 hours the nfl preseason got underway cj stroud had an opportunity to play which is great for the houston texans he's going to be their new quarterback I wonder if he's going to be good. Oh, by the way, one of the things that uh, we'll talk about during the course of this show, and we've talked about a lot, is free agency. We hope that the Cardinals go out and get one. Mark DeRosa is aware of the fact, as we all are, that Shohei Otani is going to be the prize free agent during the 23-24 offseason. But aside from Shohei, who's the next guy? Well, for me, it's Aaron Nola. Okay, because he can pitch to a one, and if he goes to another team that has a one, he can pitch to a two. He's getting one of the first two games in any postseason rotation, and this is a guy that can pitch with velocity. He could also pitch without velocity. He posts every time. You never have to worry about who's getting the ball every five days. That's what I want. I want a guy who walks in the door, and I know exactly what I'm getting. Aaron Nola, it's going to cost you. Yeah. But I like him. Friend of Wayno. Oh, yeah. I like the EDM music in the background, yeah, too. Nice. It's just like we're yeah. going to rave <laughs> yeah. while we're talking about Aaron yeah. Nola. Yeah, you got you to gotta get dancing <laughs> to get Aaron Nola on your team. Well, I'll do it. I will do it. If we, get da if we get Aaron Nola, I will dance on the YouTube. <laughs> you will dance on the YouTube. Yeah. And it's we because they won, to, they won last they, night. They did yes. win last night. Yeah. Yes, of Let, course. Let's see if we, can, if we are willing to spend some of their money and go get them because yeah. that is what it's going to boil down to. I don't know what that number is going to be. I you think somewhere between 30, 28 to 30 million? Yeah, for seven from years. The, from the Phillies? Mm -hmm. It was probably what they're going to offer them. Mm -hmm. Are the Cardinals willing to go 32 million? Are they willing to go 33 million over seven years?
Well, seven per year. The top of the market guys are getting 43. And I think that's probably going to be the range. So that would be the question. Are mm-hmm. they are the Cardinals willing to potentially overspend air quotes for for an ace, which they definitely need? Here's the advantage the Cardinals have, though, is that the Yankees have a budget and they've already got Cole and Rodon. The Dodgers are going to be after Otani, and they are already spending their money on uh, um, Kershaw, and, and obviously they've got the position players. The the Cubs may be in the hunt. The Red Sox aren't in the in a position right now where they want to spend a m- lot of money, although they do want to move Chris Sale. So the big money teams, Mets are out. So Mets, Yankees, Dodgers mm-hmm. probably out, and Angels probably out. So at least the competition shouldn't be as fierce this year as it would have been last year when the Mets were spending. And if you're keeping Nolan Arenado and Paul Goldschmidt here, you have to go out there and make sure that you get some starting pitching. You just have to this season. You can't just rely on what you did last year. And this is such a big moment because of everything that has happened this season. And I don't want to hear again that they were in just talks with people i want to see the results from those talks absolutely me too uh one other thing and you guys are fun we, we like fun right yeah. and rory mcelroy yeah. is kind of a fun guy we we read yesterday got the word that phil mickelson had bet over a billion dollars and he lost over a hundred million dollars and he also tried to place a bet on the Ryder cup uh, rory mcelroy in little exchange yesterday asked about this news um i mean at least he can bet on the Ryder cup this year because he won't be a part of it Oh, oh. oh. Rory. He is, I, I like this unhinged like version of Rory where he's nice. not holding things back. Fantastic. I love Rory. He has back had it. I like it. Yeah. I, I like a little, you know, a little head butting against one, yeah. another, one another and, and, you know, disagreeing mm-hmm. and taking shots. And, yeah. you know, guys, Phil will have something to say, sure. I'm yep. sure after that. Yeah, we're off and running, and we're going to talk more about that with our buddy Jay Delsing coming up in our next segment. Greg Amzinger, who couldn't be with us yesterday, had some pesky school meeting with <laughs> for his son, so he'll be with us at the bottom of the hour. I don't know why you don't choose the opening drive over a teacher's meeting. But yeah. He chose family. <laughs> <laughs> and then... Uh, we're going to have Bradley Carnell, the head coach of St. Louis City SC, coming up at 8.15 and at 9.15. Chip, Chip Carey, Cardinals broadcaster from Valley Sports, and a lot more coming your way here on the opening drive on 101 ESPN.
book coming out that uh, says, reports that Phil Mickelson bet a billion dollars during the course of his golfing career, lost a hundred million. And I know that Jay Delsing eclipsed that. There's no doubt about it. Jay's with us now on 101 ESPN. Good morning, sir. How you doing? I'm doing great. I mean, what's a little friendly wagering between some friends? And if it happens to get up to over a billion dollars, I mean, what the hell? Big deal. I mean, do you guys remember when I think, Randy, it was Eddie Belfort got into a little trouble with the police down in Dallas at one of the gentlemen's clubs and offered a billion dollars to the police at their little bill. I was like, yeah, let's just throw a billion dollars and uh, see what happens. Jay, are there any rules? I know we see a lot of professional athletes, football players getting suspended lately be- for betting on their sport. Are there any rules for against golfers betting on their sport? Because there was a report that Phil also bet on the Ryder Cup. Right. Well, there there isn't a when I was coming up, you were not allowed to have uh, sponsorship and and sort of agreements with anything that had to do with the, the Las Vegas and the casino. You were not allowed to represent Caesars. You were also not allowed to represent any sort of spirit companies. You couldn't represent Tito's, uh, things like that. All of that is dramatically changed because the PGA Tour is now in bed with DraftKings and with FanDuel. And um, I read an article recently, guys, that said golf in the next 10 years, they believe golf will surpass the NFL in the amount of money gambled on because they're going to make it so that you can gamble on every single shot. There's going to be way I understand it. At least there's going to be odds posted on the television. There's good, you know, what are the odds that Phil Mickelson can hit the green from here and, and, and go on and on. If he hits it in the bunker, he can, is he going to get up and down? Will he hold the putt? When we were doing the TV for Fox guys, they wanted Fox said to us, if you can give us a number on his, the odds of this player pulling this shot off, we would love it. And we were all like, we can't even talk into the microphone. How the hell are we going to do this? We were very good at the time. So it didn't work out great. That's, that's really interesting. Actually, I didn't, I didn't know about that, but that would be – something that really would change the way that people consume golf and maybe they see that as where they're going to be a little bit more involved in it more too does that their whole thought process with it i think so i think so brooke i think it, and it's and the the thing that's so interesting is that there's you know let's say coming down the stretch there's six players in the hunt they're all going to have different looking shots after a tee shot putts and things like that and so there's there's going to be you know, you basically have so many different options on things to put to, to wager on, and I think that's what, at least that's what I was when I when I read the information sent out by the PGA Tour. I, I believe that's what the draft the the betting houses love so much about the game. So, what do you think then? If we're talking about betting and gambling and just predicting things, what do you think about this prediction? Do you think John Rahm will get his porta potties at every hole like he was requesting <laughs> to the media a few days ago? I, every I read that I'm like man it must be a slow news day we've gone to but every hole he wants a porta potty on is is pretty dramatic I don't think I think that's a little unnecessary uh, but uh, you, you know <laughs> when that makes it into the news I just kind of shake my head I'm like man we had way too many news outlets here to to, to cover stuff <laughs> hey Jay the the FedEx St Jude Championship is going on this weekend and that's always been a, another one because it's close to home that's near and dear to your heart and it seems like that tournament has gained a little bit of prestige over the last few years well it, it really has Randy and I mean it's the the headquarters of FedEx uh, are directly connected to that golf course and I mean it, we've got a lot of fantastic sponsors on the PGA Tour but to Fed, you'd have to be hard pressed to find somebody that's helped us and supported us and, and, and paid more than FedEx has in the last oh gosh 20 years and um, and that's one of the things that they wanted they wanted some significance in the, the event that they they support and the um, um, St. Jude is, is the benefactor and, and, you know, guys, that, that place does such great work. I've gone to that hospital. They, I think they had Danny Thomas connected to that back in the day when there was a a, a celebrity whose name, you know, um, hosted every event. And it was always the Danny Thomas Memphis St. Jude Classic. And, and um, they do great. They do great work at that hospital, man. 
Jay, I'm reading a, a, an article about a guy in San Antonio who was fired for playing golf while on the job. So I got to know, what have you done where you skipped something important to go play golf? Oh, man, Jerry, I did everything I could. I did, you name it. I mean, I don't, I, I should have skipped my first wedding to play golf. I know. I, don't, I can't like believe I this morning, huh? Oh, man. I can't believe I said that, but I did. Um, I, um, when, when we were, when we were at UCLA, you guys, our, our, uh, schedule was just a recommendation, man. We, we were, we were doing everything we could. We were so competitive in college that if, if one of the top players was out practicing before long, there were five or six guys standing right next to him. It was just one of those things we would, we weren't the most studious. Let's say that. And Randy, you can relate to that. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Not that I'm throwing you under the bus, but it got you right into the hall of fame. You told there you me. Go. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> hey, Jay, I don't know if you heard the opening segment, but getting back to Phil, Rory was asked about uh, Phil betting on uh, the Ryder cup and the, the billion dollars this is what Rory had to say. Um, I mean, at least he can bet on the Ryder cup this year. Cause he won't be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. I did hear it. And, and, and look at where we're, we're at this place now where the gloves are taken off. I mean, it, it's, uh, there's, there's no, uh, there's no mistaking that the whole genteelness of, of golf has taken a, a backseat to, uh, to live, especially when it comes, comes to Rory and, you know, Phil, in this book, we have been waiting in the golf world. We have been waiting for this book to come out. And um, we've had I've had Alan Shipnick on the show and Michael Bamberger and a lot of some of the really good, um, uh, long respected writers uh, uh, that, that have covered golf for years and years. And um, I think it was Michael Bamberger told me a story about. Um, it was a colleague of his that was going to get a, a story and wanted to get some quotes from Phil because, you know, guys, even before all of this, Phil was a phenomenal quote machine. I mean, he would, you know, say some really outrageous things. He calls Tom Watson out publicly during the Ryder Cup and things like that. And Phil said to his colleague, hang on just a second, and they're sitting at his locker, and he said he didn't know the number, but Phil had to make a minimum of 50 bets on college oh, basketball. Wow. Yeah. Amazing, amazing. And he just over the phone. Yeah, yeah just rattled them off. And, and the notable part about that is that Phil will be watching the, the Ryder Cup on TV and I'm sure be on his phone. But it's an interesting standings now because this is not the, the 10 years ago Ryder Cup team. The standings right now, top 12. Scheffler, Wyndham Clark, Brian Harmon, Kepka, Xander Shoffley, Patrick Cantley, Homa, Cameron Young, Jordan Spieth, Keegan Bradley, Morikawa, and Sam Burns, and maybe Ricky Fowler. Man, what a different-looking Ryder Cup team the U.S. will have this year. It, it really will. And you know what's so exciting for me, guys, is the, the, the young players that are coming up, the Morikawas, the uh, uh, Max Homas, the, the, just getting some, some different sort of uh, talent in there. And, Randy, think about this. Try and name three guys on the on the uh, or four guys on from the Euro team. Oh man, right? I mean, they, they, they got absolutely wiped out from the from the stalwart uh, point of view. Not having Garcia, not having Poulter on those teams is is going to be a big deal. And um, I, 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 we have not won on the European soil in over thirty years, guys. And so it, it's a it's a big deal um, uh, for the U.S. and the U.S. players. I, I'm. Luke Donald is a great man and a, a super highly respected guy that's going to be captaining for the Euro side. But I can't wait till that his team comes out so I can check out. I mean, I know Seb Straka is not a big name for, for folks here. He's won a, a tournament on the PGA Tour this year, and he's right on the verge of getting in. But, man, I, I don't know some of the kids that are going to be on that team. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting. Jay Delsing, it's always good to hear your voice. Uh, what do you got coming up on your show this weekend? And a new 8 to 10 show on Sunday mornings here on 101 ESPN. Oh, thanks, Randy. We've got Tori, Tori Holt and uh, Isaac Bruce. They came in town and did the Legend Breakfast for the Ascension Charity Classic. It's less than a month away. And you guys, Gary, these guys were super cool we talk mm -hmm. about the foundations that they have we talk i gotta tell you these two men right now could could they could run, i can run to my refrigerator but these guys can take <laughs> off right now they look like they could play in the nfl and 
I was just so impressed with with the stuff that they do for their communities and the and the things that they talked about. Some of the things behind the scenes that the NFL does for you guys to enhance communities and just try, try to grow the game. And guys, Tory Holt has some of the nastiest looking hands you've mm-hmm. ever seen. So he's got this one <laughs> finger that is. I mean. Uh, yeah. it, it goes absolutely <laughs> south when he's pointed everything <laughs> else north. It is oh, it's amazing. I, uh, it's also yeah, amazing yep. to think that uh, Tory Holt has a senior in college. <laughs> I, I know. We, we also have Kent Bentley from the AP. He's a commissioner of the Advocate PGA Tour. Um, uh, that that is a, a tour basically for African Americans and underserved youth that just played their championship yesterday at Glen Echo. So I went out there and. 30 Business Solutions was a presenting sponsor. Of course, Nick Ragone and Ascension were the title sponsor of that thing. And it is it is awesome to see those guys out there playing. And, guys, can they smash the ball? Oh, man. Ridiculous. No oh, ridiculous. It's J- great. Jay, thanks so much. We will be tuned in on Sunday, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. See you later. Jay Delsing with us on 101 ESPN. Coming up, we're going to head back to the celebrity line. Greg Amsinger is going to join us, the lead anchor for MLB Network. Coming your way on the opening drive.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals last night take the series against the Rays 2 to 3 with a 5 2 win last night. Matthew Libertor with a gem of a start, eight innings pitch, two hits, seven strikeouts. That is the first time in his career he's ever gone eight innings, and his career high coming into this game was six innings back on June 12th against the Giants. Cardinals back in action with a two-game series in the across I-70 against the Kansas City Royals. 7-10 p.m. first pitch. It'll be Adam Wainwright facing off against the righty for the Royals, Dylan Coleman. You can hear Adam Wainwright on this show with Kerry, Brook, and Randy yesterday or with a special Thursday edition of Wednesdays with Wayno. Just go to 101ESPN.com and check that out on our Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers podcast. That is your Sports Center update driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24-7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Brooke Grimsley and Steelers Super Bowl champ Kerry Davis. I'm Randy Carricker. It's the opening drive on 101 ESPN. And every week we talk to our friend Greg Amsinger, a product of the Lindenwood University and a native of St. Louis and the most knowledgeable baseball guy we know. He is the lead anchor on MLB Network. He is the host of MLB Tonight, and he's with us now. And some of the big news coming out of baseball last night, the National League wildcard leading Phillies were able to win their game. But Bryce Harper, their first baseman, left with with an injury, a, a sore back. Greg, first thing, how long has, has Harper been dealing with this? Uh, Randy, about a week back. Yes! Yes! Greg, yes! please, no! Greg, yes! no! I, I feel bamboozled. I am shocked. I am in dismay right now. What is going on? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. I, 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 did you not hear the introduction? I am the most knowledgeable baseball person. It's about a week back. It's about a week back. Yes. Oh, no. No, 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 no. I, I feel so bamboozled right now. I appreciate it. Well, Greg, I guess I'm going to follow up with this. So we were talking about starting pitching earlier. Obviously a great outing with Matthew Libertor. So let me throw this at you. you got Miles going. you got Matt. You have Dak. You have Libby. Maybe you bring up a young guy uh, in Drew Rom, McGreevy, or even Gordon Graceffo. They don't need to go out and get another starting pitcher, right? <laughs> right, right. Hey, let's just keep doing what the Cardinals have been doing in the category of pitching for the last 20 years. And let's just, you know what? I let's get back to what we know, and that is we just grow from within. I think the experiment is, uh, has been a good one. It's, it's led to so many years of success. But when the Cardinals have won, they've always sprinkled in veterans they pay via free agency or they acquire through trade. I, I just think you will see two human beings who are not affiliated with the Cardinals organization right now in the rotation next year. I I got that feeling in my bad knee. I don't know if you know this, Brooke, but I got a bad knee. I got it in <laughs> school, a uh, bad football injury. It's a disgusting scar. And I feel things just about baseball in my bad knee. And I'm telling you, there will be two people not affiliated with the Cardinals that will be in that rotation come opening day next year. We got to ask the bad knees some more questions. So what does your bad knee say about, at least jokes aside, with this competition going on for that fifth spot and the starting to rotation possibly for next season, who do you like so far for that spot? I think Matthew Libertor, I've said for a long time, his career will be defined as the next Andrew Miller. I think of him exactly in the same vein. Now, what he did yesterday, that's it. That's like the human element, right? Like the team that traded you away, you're facing the guy that you were traded for. He had something to prove, and man, did he prove it. I still think he is, his destiny is to be a, a wipeout, uh, high-leverage reliever, maybe closer. I, I think to watch him throw 96 miles an hour in the sixth or seventh inning of that game last night makes me dream of a triple-digit left-hander who's got nasty secondary stuff. So... I, I still believe that that is his future. Steven Matz is contractually obligated to this team for the foreseeable future. To me, the, the money leads you to the answer. And that means Steven Matz is going to be the number five starter. They're going to add two other guys through free agency. But what you've seen from Matz in the last two months, I don't know if he's figured it out. I don't know if the pennant race is over, so the pressure is gone. But he, he looks great. And, and, 
because they're paying him, I think he's the number five guy. Greg, you talked about your bad knees. Let's talk about Tyler O'Neill's bad knees, and uh, he had to miss a couple of games. What are your thoughts about that and really just about him uh, and his injury history going forward? I, I think it's a decision this organization is going to have to make. It, 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 the problem is no one else is seeing the 30-30 potential that he possessed just a few years ago. What I mean by no one else, the other 29 teams uh, are not witnessing a display of talent that was incredibly unique when he was playing like an MVP candidate. So the Cardinals are trying to play him as much as possible to show all of these other front offices that what they have is valuable and that you should come knock on the door and see if you want to swing a deal. It is not a secret that the Cardinals have too many outfielders. The problem is, is how many starting outfielders do the Cardinals have in the big league in the big leagues they have four fourth outfielders that's not hmm. someone who's wealthy in, in, in depth that's not incredible wealth so the Cardinals are banking on Tyler O'Neill getting back in the lineup and playing well they need to see him play well so they can showcase what he can do I still think he's an immense talent I really do and I, and I do believe there will be a couple teams that will kick the tires on the upside of Tyler O'Neill. But the only way this is going to happen is if he gets on the field again and it's in bombs. Uh, Greg Amzinger, MLB Network with us on 101 ESPN. Greg, easy question. For me, this is a tough answer. How did the Dodgers do it? It's crazy, right? It's unbelievable. Look, all you have to do, all you have to do is just drive to Dodger Stadium and look at all the images behind the center field wall of all the rookies of the year they've ever had. They have developed players at a level no one else can come close to. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Now, I've been trying to think, why is it young players go to L.A. and they outplay other young players from other places? And then I realized, wait a minute, there are celebrities, like legitimate celebrities. I, mean, I know we think John Goodman's Brad Pitt in St. Louis. I understand that. But, like, real celebrities are, like, LeBron is sitting in the fourth row behind home plate. Shaquille O'Neal, you know, actually Brad Pitt is sitting in the stands at the Dodger game, right? So these young guys walk into the big leagues, and that's already overwhelming. And then they realize they're in Hollywood. And that's why you've got a guy like James Altman playing with his hair on fire. Before that, it was Cody Bellinger. Before that, you go to Eric Karros and Mike Piazza. All these young guys show up, and they're like, wow, I'm literally in a human movie. I just played baseball in it. It, it, it it's incredible. They're young talent. Uh, and they showcased it last night with the big right-hander Miller that was on the mound. They've got so many young, talented players that are good, and then they mix in the big money. They mix in Freddie Freeman and Mookie Betts. They do it at a high level, and they're going to win the West again. And you, you mentioned the big money with Betts and, and Freeman, but the rest of their lineup last night, and I know they were playing the Rockies, but it was Ahmed Rosario playing second and hitting third. Max Muncy hitting 195 this year was their cleanup hitter. Chris Taylor is hitting 210. He was their number five hitter. Kike mm -hmm. Hernandez, who was terrible. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, Altman, Miguel Rojas hitting 215 is their shortstop hitting eighth, and Austin Barnes, their catcher, is hitting ninth. And by the way, Austin Barnes hitting 126 this year. And they, on a regular basis, it's not just this year. They, they get guys, and they have a lineup with a couple of, of, of guys, and then you say, how the hell are they doing this? I, obviously, they can pitch, but they have an unbelievable ability to get, the, as you said, the most out of players. Yeah, and, and may I remind you, come game one of their postseason series, their first postseason series, the top of their order will look Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman, uh, Will Smith, who's become one of the best overall catchers in the game, mm -hmm. J.D. Martinez, who's had an incredible resurgence this year, and then you got Max Muncy, who's a feast or famine home run guy, and then Ahmed Rosario, who looks like he's loved baseball. Again. That's another little subplot here. You get Josh Bell out of Cleveland, and all of a sudden he's hitting home runs in Miami. You get Rosario uh, out of Cleveland, all of a sudden he can swing a bat again. I don't. You know, everyone always asks what's in the Kool-Aid. They need to spike the Kool-Aid in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's hitting like Stephen Kwan. Everyone's hitting like Miles Straw. It's not good to Terry Francona. Greg, do you think that the Cardinals will have any problems enticing? If we're talking about stars, what the Dodgers are able to do. Obviously, you can't offer all that that L.A. has with that star power there. But do you think that the Cardinals will have any problems enticing some star pitching coming here to St. Louis? Or will the money be enough to talk? I, I think it was a really smart decision to hold on to Nolan Arenado when you have a legit superstar who is obsessed with winning 
and you saw how it all unraveled after he had a monster contract extension with the Colorado Rockies when he realized, wait a minute, this, this, this organization sort of lied to me. They're not all about winning. And he was not a happy camper, and we all saw what happened. They, they had to move him. I think the Cardinals deciding to not trade Nolan Arenado is a reflection of their commitment to winning. And if you're a free agent starting pitcher, you don't want to sign somewhere. Obviously, everyone wants to go to the most money, right? Everybody wants that. But you also want a mixture of culture and a desire to win. And it's not just going to end with you starting pitcher. Or you're going to spend money at second base. We're going to spend money in center field. We're going to actually put a team around you. So I think having Nolan Arenado, Paul Goldschmidt, who wants to retire a Cardinal – in your organization, playing for the foreseeable future, makes it a much more attractive destination for other free agents who are trying to be courted to St. Louis. If you move Nolan Arenado and you, you operate business like most other organizations to try to save a buck, that saving a buck has a ripple effect, and it affects other players who you're trying to spend a buck on later. So to me, it, it, it kind of gave the stability of a winning culture. Even though they're having a losing season this year, they guaranteed a winning culture by holding on to Captain Win, Nolan Arnano. Greg, last week you gave us a peek into the Amzinger household. So a texter from the 618 wants to know, did the sprinkler system get to working? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So I had a water bubble. It's a great question. <laughs> have, have you ever heard of a water bubble in your backyard? I've seen I one, a, yeah. I had a sprinkler pipe that had like eight holes in it. And I, I just bought this property. So I walked back in this, this water bubble. I think this guy's trying to get money out of me, right? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm like thinking, I'm thinking in grass. Like, literally, I'm going down in the earth. So he's like, don't worry about it. It's just about, you know, four to $5,000 extra. We'll pull the pipe out and replace So I'm like, this is the best day ever. Best day ever. Frequent system is working, thank goodness. Um, but, yeah, that was a pretty wonderful moment of Rob Live Radio. One of my favorites, actually. <laughs> he was trying to get me to come downstairs while I was on your show. <laughs> hey, Greg, one last thing in regards to baseball. The most unlikeliest of places, Philadelphia, has become this forgiving, charitable place for Trey Turner where they give him a standing ovation all the time. And, and you guys show it a lot. But what a great story that is in, of all places, of Philly. You think about it. I, the one thing I've learned about Philadelphia, and I go to Philly games more than I go to Yankee games or Met games. That's not that's a lie. Because going to a Yankee and Met game is a brutal uh, experience of driving. It's terrible. But I can drive 90 minutes. My big thing is I don't care how long I'm driving. I just want to go forward. As long right? as you're moving, <laughs> right. I, I need to move. So I'd rather drive to Philly <laughs> than go to a Mets game or a Yankee game. It's terrible. But what I've realized in all of my time going there is the Philadelphia fans are – symbolic and a reflection of Larry Boa. And if you know Larry Boa, he is the most fierce, yelling, angry manager you've ever met in your life. But when you see Larry around his wife, he's like an altar boy. He doesn't swear. He's like the most wonderful gentleman in the world because she is a kind person and she has expectations and she's very humble with him and honest with him. I just, I've witnessed all of this. And then I see Philly fans sort of emulate that behavior. If there's a reason to go crazy, they do. But if someone says, Hey, I love you. Thank you, Philly fans for being by my side. Thank you. I know I've been terrible. Thank you for being by my side. They start acting like Larry Boa. They put away their chewing tobacco. They stop throwing their hat. They don't throw anything on the field. And then they stand up and give you an ovation. They're very hot and cold. There's no gray area in Philadelphia. They either hate you or they love you. And somehow, Trey Turner was able to spin a 230 batting average into a standing ovation. It was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. And I'm happy for him because, man, when they get on you, it's rough. It is. Hey, uh, before we came on, before the uh, the commercial break, I, I kind of got on you for choosing your family over us yesterday. But I was just joking. <laughs> I was just joking that you went to a, a school meeting. Uh, I really didn't mean it. Uh, no, listen, I, I I would choose my family over you first. I, I'm really <laughs> sorry about that. I am sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, sometimes things come up. Like I found out late last night that tomorrow at 9 a.m. I'm teeing off with Albert Pujols. All right. All right. Okay. Oh. Oh. Um, but now, now, it's not just my family. If that would have come up today, chances are I would have to bail on the interview. <laughs> I, you know what I mean, Randy? <laughs> no, it's not just family. There are other things that happen that make you have to bail. And I think you would understand that golfing with Albert would trump 
doing the fast lane, right? You understand that. Yeah. Well, the fast lane and the opening drive. But, yeah, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, Greg, if, if I had a tea time with Albert this morning, I wouldn't be here either. <laughs> he would leave. Yeah, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be here. No, I got to be honest with you real quick, real quick, before we go. Uh, day, day day four of MLB Network, we let uh, Dan Plesak host a, a side set um, portion of the show. And we and I go, hey, man, when you're done, just go to break. And he goes, okay. And Dan Plesak, who I adore, goes, all right, don't go anywhere much more baseball tonight right after this and we all he thought he was great we do dude, dude you just named our show baseball tonight <laughs> <laughs> oh my god uh, <laughs> that was a wonderful little moment it's only been there for sorry i love the opening drive the opening drive i've got an opening drive tattoo on my back there you go <laughs> and he's got the family cup i've got the opening drive there you go. hey uh thanks for playing along it was fun we appreciate it and uh yeah how, again how long for harper has he had that? Uh, about, a week, about a week back. <laughs> no, we can't start and end yes, the segment this Thank way. You, tell, Thank you. No. Tell, tell, <laughs> tell Albert we said hi. All right, you got to Take care, guys. Thanks, brother. Oh. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, it was fun. It is. I cannot. Brent, Brent I cannot. Nice. Ha, ha, well done. Well done. Thank you, Brian. The fact that you guys roped <laughs> Greg into this, <laughs> I cannot. That's <laughs> so much fun. Take it or leave it. It's coming your way next on 101 ESPN. And give us your take it or leave it. Brought to you by Gloria Lou Realty. Visit GloriaHasTheBuyers.com and start packing. That's my final offer. Take it or leave it. The 
text line is open. 314-399-9646. 314-399-YOHO. For Take It or Leave It, Brooke Carey, Take It or Leave It, Greg Amzinger is right, and Matthew Libertor winds up being an Andrew Miller-type relief pitcher. Ooh. Ooh. I... Uh, I'm going to leave that. Okay. I think he's going to be a starter. He's going to be an ace. He's going to be better than Randy Rosarena will be in his career, and the Cardinals will eventually have won that trade. Ooh, I like that. I like I like a hot take. Yeah. I, I do think I can see him being a reliever. I don't think that that's too crazy of a thought. I do hope that he continues to get a shot at being a starter. I just see him for possibly the majority of his career being a reliever. And we watch him last night. He's like... I mean, yeah, he looked good he's going to be the best pitcher ever. Next <laughs> next year, either. Yeah. He, <laughs> Shohei who? Yeah. Right. Ne- next year, either he or Thompson is going to be in the bullpen. I kind of think that the Cardinals yes. look at Thompson more as a relief pitcher. Mm-hmm. That's why I would, at the outset here right now, say that next year, Libertor would probably be the Cardinals' number five starter. Hmm. And then Thompson would find his way into the bullpen. Yeah. And uh, by the way, I, I think it, it'll be free agent Michaelis. Free agent, Matt's, Libertor. That's, I still think the Cardinals are going to import two starting pitchers. It's going to be so frustrating. You have when to. Free agent, Michaelis, Matt's, Libertor, Thompson. Thompson. Mm-hmm. Dakota yeah. Hudson is a piggyback. Yeah. He's, he's, he's there. He's there. Yeah. He's there. So the 49ers had a contingency plan to use Phillip Rivers had they made it to the Super Bowl. Bring him out of retirement. Mm-hmm. Have him start in the Super Bowl. Take it or leave it. They need to keep Phillip Rivers' number on speed dial. Take it. Ooh. They keep quarterbacks injured there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. I would definitely take that. Yeah. I mean, Sam Darnold's not winning any Super Bowls for you, is he? Yeah, you're going to see. He's going to get hurt. Yeah. What are we talking about? They, they, they were on their by, fifth by quarterback last year. By when, you think? Um, if, we, if we already put, like, a wager on that. So, Brock Purdy will start the season. He'll probably run into an issue around week seven or eight. Okay. Trey Lance. He'll be injured by week 13. Oh, man, you're giving him a lot of leash. I yeah, would say I week nine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, who am I missing? Darnold. Darnold, Sam Darnold. He'll get you to week 15, and then then you'll try to bring Brock Purdy back, but you're going to have to give a call to old Phillip. I like that timeline. All right. What take- do you think? Hold on, Brooke. we got to get your take on this one. How, <laughs> on when, that whole timeline? Yeah, when, when do you think yeah, Phillip Rivers winds up? What, what week does Phillip Rivers wind up quarterbacking the 49ers? I think around maybe you think that this is actually going to happen. Okay. If I just had to guess, maybe like week seven. Oh, that's early. (laughs) Hey, hey, I'm saying injuries. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Injuries. They're going to (laughs) happen. All right. Take it or leave it, guys. Starting next season, because I'm trying to figure out, we talked a little bit about Andrew Kisser, who's obviously been doing great, fantastic this season. You would hope to keep that around, but take it or leave it to start next season you won't have Andrew Kisner, Yvonne Herrera, and Wilson Contreras are here. One of those three is going to be moved. I'm going to take gonna, that I'm during the offseason. I'm going to leave it. You okay. think you're going to have three catchers on the roster? Well, you're going to have a DH and two catchers. Randy? You are we, big on the we, DH. We, we, well, where is Nolan Gorman going to play? Uh, he'll find a spot. Where is Brendan Donovan going to play? Seattle? <laughs> Seattle? <laughs> oh, so you're going to get Logan Gilbert? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is that not, yeah. for, oh, okay. not for Brendan Donovan. Not not straight up. That's where you start. Okay. Yeah. I, <laughs> I can, just got to try to sneak that in there. <laughs> Seattle? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, Matthew, what do you got on the text line there? 636 says, take it or leave it. The weak back joke will never get old. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Take it. Never. Can I plead the fifth on this? <laughs> never. No, I'm kidding. It's not the same I, I, I do. I will say I truly enjoy every day trying to figure out when and how you guys are going to uh-huh. sneak it into a certain conversation. <laughs> every day. Every and, game. and today was probably one of the best because I, I truly was not expecting it to Everybody, involve <laughs> Greg. <laughs> the fact that you guys roped Greg into this. Consummate that, professional. I, I do like being shocked and surprised by, uh, by that. So all. it's it's fun. Yes. Roped is one way to describe just a guy happily playing along. <laughs> sure, okay. Take it, leave it. Into it. Cardinals make at least one coaching change in the offseason. Take it. Mm. Ooh. I'm going to take it. And I think it might wind up just being an addition. You know how, like, Dusty Blake was the assistant to Mike Madison? He was the pitching special- specialist? Yeah. I think they could use an experienced pitching coach to be an assistant there. Will you add a 
catching specialist, catching that, coach. I think organizationally season. they need to do that, but I don't know. If, I don't know if that guy needs to be with the Cardinals every day. Okay, but I think they need do need. You need an organizational catching instructor. Yes. So take it or leave it. Nobody gets rehomed. Then I'm going to take that. Take it. How nobody about Chris Carpenter home. to be your your assistant that. pitching coach? Would he want to do that? I think he'd probably like being at the major league level mm-hmm. rather than the minor league level, which is where he is right now with uh, with Anaheim. What about Izzy? Would he come up to the major? Izzy's league? in the organization already. I wonder if he would do that. But to the, I'm saying like to the major league level. Yeah, I, I, I wonder. Text me, Izzy. Tell me if you would. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll get it straight from you, Izzy. Yeah, there you go. But yeah, Izzy would be great for that. Not yeah. only from the physical aspect, but there's no better mental pitching uh, assistant for young pitchers. If you're going to have a young bullpen, you couldn't have a better guy than Jason Isringhausen to help him out. He's the best at that. We got this one back-to-back, which is crazy from two different textures. Take it or leave it. MLB having the cards off on a Sunday is unacceptable. I'll take it. When are we off on a Sunday? I guess this two-game series, Friday, Saturday, and then there's uh, then they're oh, off really? on Sunday before they are back in action That's on Monday stupid. against, um, who is it? Uh, is it an AL team? Another AL team? Yeah, the Athletics. They go out to... Uh, we got Oakland here. Oakland, yeah, they come back here, but yeah, they're off on Sunday. I mean, they're only coming from Kansas City. That's nice for the boys. It is. You, you, get, out, you, get, out of, you get out of Kansas City Saturday night. You get all of Sunday back in St. Louis before you host the Athletics. For, <laughs> they they want to get a brunch a nice in. Three game series. A nice yeah, Sunday oh, brunch. Oh, yeah, they're going to be able to brunch like crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, that is no major league team during the season should be off on Sunday. None. Yeah, that's crazy. It's no? just stupid. Especially Dude. one, especially a Sunday right as the school year starting. Rob, that Rob, seems Rob. insane to me. Like, don't sh- if anything, shouldn't this like yeah. that should be when you prioritize weekend games? You'd think so. Yeah, that's all right. I didn't even thought about it's it. only the Royals. You think they're saying it's only the Cardinals? <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, the, Roy- yeah. the Royals are probably. pretty freaking bad. Uh, <laughs> take yeah. it or leave it. Jordan Walker's primary position is ultimately in the infield. Leave it. Leave so it. The, this person's saying in the future they'll vi- he'll eventually be in the infield. Yes. I think that he's too athletic. I think you'd be wasting some premier athleticism if you put him at first base, and that's where we're talking about right here. So I would say that I would leave that. Take it or leave it. Saying that Sammy Blay and Jake Neighbors are potentially second-line players is telling the fan base that this is not a playoff team. Who's saying that? Who is saying that? that. Hmm? Who is saying that? I don't, I, I don't I haven't heard anybody say so that. So I've got Sammy Blay on my fourth line with Torpchenko oh. and Sonny. Oh. And, and my second line, the second slash third. Would be Pavel Buchnevich would be a part of that. I th- Braden I, I've Shin. Got, I've got Buchnevich up. First line. Oh, yeah. Huh? First oh, line. yeah. First line. First line. Buch, Buch Kairou, and true, Thomas. Because Cassidy then you have Rana. Kapanen on the second yeah. line. Kapanen, on the Rana, line. Shen. And then maybe a third line with uh, neighbors, Hayes, and do, uh, do Verana and Casper Kapanen play enough defense to be on the? I think line they do. Together? Yeah, Kapanen does. And then Shenner will drag him into the fight. Uh, drag him. Drag <laughs> literally. Yeah. I mean, the only and then, and then Sod with um, uh, with Hayes and who did I just mention? As neighbors. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like no, I don't. Uh, I, I don't see Blay or neighbors as. Top six guys at the moment. I, Apparently, I really that was a need. comment by Jr. yesterday when he was uh, on the show with uh, Danny Mac. Come on, Jr. Start, start paying attention. I, to I your really team. need Jake Neighbors to, to to perform really well. Th- that's the one thing is I wonder if their thought process no, this is, is this is me. If being we're selfish. playing Jake Neighbors, he should be a second liner. Like he, if we're perform. playing him the minutes we want him to get at this level instead of him getting you know as much time as possible, today, we want though. him to be a second liner. Well, ultimately, but let him earn it. Yeah, I mean, yes. So that's fine. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Randy. And thank you. <laughs> <laughs> JR, I, I'm just joking. By the way. <laughs> yeah, I know, JR. I'm, I'm waiting for a text yeah. from oh, he's, JR. He's there. Where he's he's accountable just, next week. Yeah. Thursday, just get ready, what are, JR. Yeah, what are you doing, Fingers JR? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Coming up here on 101 ESPN, do you think the Cardinals will spend $30 million a year on a pitcher? That's next on 101 ESPN.
Hey everyone, it's Brooke here. This past winter, my father went through hip and then back surgery. After being active his whole life, biking and competing in triathlons, as he got older, the wear and tear led to constant pain and limited mobility. But finally, after getting surgery this past winter, he is back to moving around pain free. He even visited a few weekends ago and he was able to get around great. He says that he wishes he would have done it sooner. You might be in a similar situation, just continuing to put it off because you just don't want to deal with the hassle of it. But anyone who has suffered from serious back or joint pain knows how hard it can be to find lasting relief. Here's the thing, though. You don't have to live in pain. You can find that relief at SSM Health Orthopedics. They are the experts at diagnosing and treating joint problems, offering many treatment options, including non-surgical techniques to find the best solution for you so that you can get back to doing the things that you love. So don't wait today. Visit SSM Health slash Top Ortho for more information and to find lasting relief. From the Car Shield Studio, this is the opening drive on 101 ESPN. A fresh perspective on the day's top stories. It's the opening drive's fresh take. Brought to you by Schnucks Rewards. Reward yourself. Earn 2% back on every purchase with the Schnucks Rewards app. Last December, when the Cardinals had completed their off-season shopping, John Mozeliak said to Derek Gould at stltoday.com, our model will be tested. That model of developing and counting on players that have been injured in the past. Clearly, with the Cardinals being where they are in the standings, last place in the Central, the model that was tested has failed that test. So the question is, is a new model going to emerge for the Cardinals in 2024? And will they spend to get a number one starter? Because it doesn't appear that they have a number one starter emerging. They may have one, but they don't know. Do they have a Dylan Cease on the way? Do they have a McClanahan on the way? Do they have a 26-year-old stud that is going to be potentially a number one in 2024? I don't believe they do. So the question then becomes, do the Cardinals have the gumption to spend $30 million or more a year AAV on a pitcher. I kind of think they do because of Moe's comment last December about the model being tested and uh, re recognizing that if that model doesn't work, if you're going to win, you're going to have to develop a new model. And I think that uh, that MO, uh, that, that model will include spending big money on a starting pitcher. I agree. I mean, you you have to... If you're going to keep, as Greg Amsinger mentioned a little bit earlier, by keeping Nolan Arnato and Paul Goldschmidt around, that's signaling that you are trying to do more. You're going to try to vie for the playoffs again. This season was absolutely terrible. And just think if you could have has had some more established starting pitching or, I mean, there was a multitude of things that just culminated this season for the Cardinals that just all crashed and burned. But it was very clear that starting pitching is something they're lacking, some more swing and miss stuff. And having somebody atop of your rotation 
medication just to stabilize things, stabilize things and really set the tone. They need to go and do that. It's really interesting because we keep having people text in asking about Yamamoto and the possibility of him coming to the Cardinals. What do you guys think about that? Japanese pitcher, we have seen, obviously, that Japanese pitchers can come over and be very successful at the major league level here, but I haven't seen any reports out there of Yamamoto being looked at by the Cardinals. And here's the other thing about a guy like Yamamoto. Traditionally in Japan, they go with a six-man or even a seven-man rotation. And when Japanese pitchers come to the United States, they don't have innings under their belt. They, are, they aren't built up to throw 180, 190, 200 innings. To me, that's one of the big things the Cardinals need yeah. is somebody that can protect the bullpen every fifth day. You need multiple guys to do that. I believe that Miles Michaelis does that. So that gives you two, but I think you need multiple guys to that you feel like, okay, I'm comfortable that that guy's going to give me 180, 190, 200 innings. Here's a text from the 314. Yes, the Cardinals will spend $30 million on a pitcher. In 10 years, when the average is $50 million. <laughs> Just <laughs> basically saying, no, that's not what they do. And I, I think I tend to agree with that. I don't know that the Cardinals are willing to spend $30 million plus on an ace, even though it is needed for next season. We saw how this season kind of derailed really quickly with uh, the starting pitch in the bullpen. If you have younger younger players in the bullpen that are potentially stars in the future, you can build them up in the bullpen, and get a getting an ace would be the best way to go about it. I just don't know if the Cardinals are going to be willing to spend that money. I could see them spending, you know, $45 million between two, two pitchers, 50 million between two pitchers, but I don't know if you're going to get 30 of that on on one guy. Well, if you go 30 and 20, if you spend 50, then you've got what you well, I'm need. Thinking, uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking 25 and 25. Well, 25. Uh, I, I don't think you'll get to. I don't. I don't know if that number is is something that they're willing to spend. We talked about it all last season that the payroll would increase, mm-hmm. and it did, but. It was kind of left up to the, the the listener to assume that it was going to be much higher than it was. I, I thought I think most people thought the numbers would be much higher than they were. The spending would be much higher, and it, it wasn't. So I think that's the the frustration that Cardinals fans have is that and the the lack of belief that they will go out and spend that money. You see, I do think that they're not necessarily afraid to spend money. Is how they have spent the money in the past that we've seen with free agency is what I think causes a lot of alarm bells for people and rightly so if you just look at that history of free agents they have signed even how they have handled this whole Wilson Contreras situation they were willing to pay him 87 and a half million was anybody else even kind of thinking that he was going to get that kind of money I don't know it seemed like the Cardinals were the ones who were mostly in on that so they have the willingness to spend money it's how they spend it and getting that value back where it actually works for them and that's I think that's the big concern but this has been such a, a weird season and it's been such a stain in the Cardinals long history that I think you do have to do something different this offseason you have to do something out of character and because it, it's what the fans deserve and you have 18 and a half million coming off the books with Wayno about six million with O'Neill you presume that he won't be here six million with Jack Flaherty who's gone 10 million with Jordan Montgomery who's gone now you're going to have some internal rises in salary, but you're going to have a pretty substantial drop-off in just the the cash outlay. The other thing we have to look at, CD, is where salaries are right now. Somebody who, a a, a starting pitcher who gets $30 million a year would slot in right now as the fourth highest paid starter in baseball, behind only Cole, uh, Strasburg, and DeGrom. Now, that's just for the, the AAV for this year, but for overall, obviously, you'll have Scherzer and uh, and Verlander ahead of them. But they have uh, uh, they they have contract situations that officially need to be taken care of. But I, I would think that there's a chance that the Cardinals could go there and get a pitcher that's in the top five in terms of AAV. I think the worst thing that can happen for the Cardinals and for Cardinal fans is for Matthew Libertor, Zach Thompson, and Dakota Dakota Hudson to keep performing in the way that they did. That, that's probably the worst case scenario for fans. And I say that because they will not go out and spend money if those three guys perform at it, at a level that they have the last few starts. I, I I personally believe that the Cardinals will say, you know what? Why do we need to go yeah. spend the money when we got the guys here already? And one thing that Mo has said is that he really isn't buying into what happens in the last couple of months, unless he's lying. And he, he I, I don't think he lies. I don't believe that the Cardinals are going to trust that. That that, that would be 
malpractice on their part, and I can't imagine that he would go through the, this entire stretch and say, we need, we can't fill out a staff unless we participate in free agency and then not participate in free agency. One guy. One guy in free agency, not two. I, I don't I don't see I don't see again, if those three guys continue to perform that way, I I, I would almost bet a good significant significant amount of money that two of those guys will be in the rotation next year. And then you gotta look at the the minors. You got McGreevy, you got Graceffo, all of those guys will be here. You will have two guys that are in the organization on this starting rotation next year if they perform the way that they have right now. I think you can never have enough pitching depth because then you have that ability to move guys around and where you possibly wouldn't be putting Zach Thompson, what you put him through this season of where he's in the bullpen, then he's being stretched out mm-hmm. as a starter, back into the bullpen, then possibly a starter. I I don't want them to go through that situation again. I think that maybe it comes, one starting pitcher comes via trade this offseason. Another one, you got to go spend some money on too, which you're going to spend money for both, but either way. But still, you got to spend this offseason. Yeah, by the way, the, the AAVs, Verlander and Scherzer, both at $43 million, DeGrom at 37 Cole at 36 and then it drops down to uh, Strasburg at 35 and he's insurance money now. And then Otani at 30 this year. He'll make a lot more next year. And then Chris Sale at 29 Rodon at 27 So uh, I, I would think Nola probably slots in in that b- between 27 and 30 area. Coming up here on 101 ESPN, we're going to talk to St. Louis City SC's head coach, uh, Bradley Carnell will join us as his club, his side, is getting ready to get back in action next week. We'll talk to the coach next on 101 ESPN.
Downtown City SC on the opening drive in our weekly segment we like to call Controlled Chaos. Brought to you by Keystone Event Staffing. Better people mean better events. Carrie and Randy, it's the opening drive, 101 ESPN, St. Louis City SC back in action against Austin FC a week from Sunday, but they'll have a tune-up scrimmage on uh, tomorrow, actually, at Atlanta United, and the head coach of St. Louis City SC, Bradley Carnell, kind enough to join us on the opening drive. Coach, good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, doing very well. Thanks for having me again this morning. How have you felt about these last couple of weeks where your team has not really had activity since you were eliminated from the League's Cup? Yeah, listen, I mean, I think uh, over the last couple of months, um, you know, the way we've gone about our business in the league and, and the way we've always made, found a way to bounce back and, you know, with, with our group against all odds and against all expectations uh, to finally get to a point where, you know, for sure momentum would have been great, um, but also reflection is also a thing of wonder. So just thinking about what's gone on over the last couple of months, uh, giving the guys, you know, a mental and, and physical, uh, just a pause, you know, um, and, and the, the rigors of an MLS season. I've done this now for nearly seven seasons, and uh, it's, it's crazy for the players. I know how taxing it is for the staff, and um, I can only imagine with the travel and, and the competition and how tight the league is, uh, for the players, for them to get a welcome a uh, couple of days off here was, was just exactly what we needed. Um, you know, it's it's a pity and, and a shame we didn't really, you know, uh, feature too much in that League Cup. And uh, But we, we're trying to draw the positives out of each situation. And, uh, yeah, we build up and move on. And uh, we, we mean business. And, and I think with the intent of a, a very serious scrimmage against Atlanta, um, you know, I think that just shows our intent for, for what we want to do in these next 11 games. Bradley, when you get time off like this, how do you decide which is more important, rest versus work? Obviously, guys need the rest, but you want to stay sharp as possible. How do you decide which one is more important for your team? Yeah, I mean, listen, sometimes it's forced upon you, right? So, I mean, yeah, it was unfortunate that we, like I said, you know, we bow out in, in the League Cup. Um, I think everybody would have enjoyed progressing in that tournament and, and extending our, uh, you know, participation in that event. But, uh, you know, if you look at the way, you know, we, we played against Columbus and it was just okay, uh, could have tied the game up at the end there. Um, but against Club America, we were, you know, on the day, physically totally outmatched and, and technically as well. So we were just like, OK, uh, time to hit a bit of a reset button, time to just clear the heads. And, and sometimes the, the event itself or the game itself dictates what's needed. And I think what was needed was, a, uh, you know, a well-deserved break. City SC acquiring Icelandic forward Nukvi Torreson on July 21st, and he's finally bound for the U.S. So what is going to be the plan for getting him with the club, and what could we expect to see from him? Yeah, I think Nukvi, I mean, you have to speak about his qualities, right? He's a very big presence. He's, a, he's an aggressive runner. He's dynamic. He's got some good speed, and he scores goals at his various clubs that he's been at. So, um, you know, the biggest thing is now is getting him acclimated and getting him ready. And um, so he arrives within the next couple of hours. Uh, so he, it's imminent, you know, he, he arrives here. So he, I don't think he'll be able to, to fly with us to Atlanta. Um, but it's important he spends the next two, three days getting him, you know, situated and settled here in St. Louis. Uh, and we'll get going from, from Tuesday with an overall assessment evaluation of, of just where Nook is at. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about him. You know, it just adds another layer of depth to our roster. It adds a bit more competition to those starting spots at the, you know, in the attacking end of the field. And, you know, it's a nice push now with 11 games to go. It's going to go by so quickly. Um, and if we can have, you know, added pieces and quality and depth and guys, you know, staying honest in all in all departments, uh, you know, it can only bring us good fortune. And Bradley, another part of that depth is the trade for left back Anthony Marcanic from Colorado. What sort of impact will he make on your squad? Yeah, listen, I mean, uh, yeah, I think there's two slightly different profiles, right? One is 23, um, and a guy who at Colorado wasn't getting many minutes uh, playing for Colorado too. Uh, you know, we see some nice, interesting attributes for him. So um, whether he can help us straight away or whether now it's a piece to be, you know, just in terms of developing and nurturing and, and grooming, um, and, and we have different platforms to do that with, you know. So Anthony, he knows the league. He's played the league. He's played against us, uh, you know. He's, he's dynamic. He's a runner. He plays a pretty good ball. 
Um, so we were very excited about working with Anthony. Um, we just need to make sure that we just don't throw him in the deep end too soon. You know, we want to get him to accustom in our style of play first. And uh, But again, you know, City 2 has been doing amazing things this, this season in the last couple of weeks. So, you know, we might uh, introduce him with us or it might be a City 2 game. So we have we have multiple platforms to, to develop further there. Bradley, I know fans are, are looking forward to seeing Jao Klaus back on the pitch. Are, is there any update on his status? Yeah, so Zhao is progressing um, at quite a good rate. Um, so, you know, he's building up his fitness right now. He's lost a lot of substance. Um, so, obviously, with that substance, anything you do on the field now in terms of return to play, it builds a lot of fatigue. So, he's going through this in-between phase right now between sustaining how many minutes he can go in training um, and, and, and uh, trying to get his body up to a certain to a certain level to compete with the rest of the teammates. So I would say he's still ways off, uh, you know, in terms of uh, competing with, with guys, but uh, he's, he's getting there and it could be a couple more days now until he's fully integrated with the team. But, you know, finally we can see some light at the end of the tunnel here. I think fans are just very eager to get back to league play. This past Sunday, uh, City 2 breaking their own single game attendance record with 9,489 fans. What does that just continue to show you about the support that fans give anything with City in this city? Well, one thing is doing it on the very first day, <clears throat> early March of 2022. The other thing is doing it in August of 2023. So it just shows that the fans are here to stay, right? So, um, and it shows the intent and the passion and, you know, of, of what the St. Louis uh, soccer fan and the culture is all about, right? So, um, and, and kudos to the club, you know, I mean, they gave us a, a facility right downtown. They put it in the heart of St. Louis. Uh, the club made a statement. The ownership group made a statement with, with the intent of where they want to take soccer uh, you know, in the country uh, with with this team in St. Louis and what it will do for the St. Louis. But now it takes two, right? So now the fans, there's so much history, culture embedded into into everything we're doing. And it's it's it's, it's really amazing to see for a City 2 game, like 8,500 people, nearly 9,000 people going to a City 2 game and supported by all our first team uh, staff and players, which is, it's a really proud moment, I think, for everybody involved in, in St. Louis soccer right now. So, um, there's a lot to play for, you know. There's a lot of things happening with City 2. We, we continuously send guys down to get valuable minutes, and we've seen the progression of those minutes, like in Aziel Jackson, uh, who now, you know, is, is playing a real key role in the first team. Um, but going down and making sure that he's staying honest and, and does his job first, right? So um, we see a lot of progression and a, and a pathway for players to go from uh, City 2 to the first team. Bradley, I, I often like to talk to soccer people because I, I once did the beep test and almost died. And so I am intrigued when it comes to fitness for soccer players. How do you all know when they are at their peak uh, of, of fitness for, for you all to go out there and play? Yeah, it's just sustainability, right? So, I mean, we, we go in bursts because the way we train and the way we play it's like, you know, we're, we're hunting for our prey, right? So we're not just taking a jog around the field for 45 minutes. Um, we go in spurts of like 30 seconds, 45 seconds. And, and that's how we train. And, and if we can continuously uh, in a repeatability, like just repeat and go again, repeat and go again. So, um, yeah, it's, it's just how, uh, how quick can you uh, come back from a 45-second burst, like a burner, really? You know, the way we train, we go six by 50 seconds, six by 90 seconds in these little rondos. Um, and the minute that becomes automated and the guys are flying after the sixth one, then you know that, all right, the fitness levels are picking up. Obviously, you need a bit of endurance there to, to get you the volume, you know, um, the extensive work. But, uh, yeah, to be fair, you know, the beep test is maybe a preseason thing. And, Oof. you know, we have a, we have a six-minute, you know, a, a run uh, that the players do, an evaluation. Um, but most of my work and, and the vision and the philosophy I believe in is that everything's done with the ball, you know? So even our fitness, uh, if we're doing enough work uh, hunting and chasing and, and dynamically transitioning with the ball, I promise you, in my session, you won't need to run anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Bradley, you said hunting for prey. You got this 42-year-old man. I got juices flowing when you said that. If you need somebody, <laughs> I got a couple of bursts in me. I don't have many. I got possibly five good bursts, but they're going to be five of the hardest bursts you've ever seen. 
<laughs> I'll look forward to seeing that one day. I'll really, let's get you down. <laughs> hey, Bradley, before we let you go, we'd be remiss as, as an MLS veteran uh, if we didn't ask you uh, what your take is on uh, Lionel Messi's initial foray into MLS. What have you thought? Yeah, I mean, uh, I look back and, and think uh, we were a week too too early. I mean, obviously, we get the three points against them, but, man, what a what a game it mm-hmm. would have been here at City Park with, with Messi in town, you know? Um, I think you have to include... Alba, I think you have to include, excuse me, you have to include just what everybody's done there at that club in terms of, you know, who they brought in. It's not just Messi, right? And then everyone plays off of Messi and Messi plays off of everyone. But he is a difference maker for sure, scoring the amount of goals and the dead ball situation. So anytime there's there's a set piece in and around your, your 18-yard area, it's like a penalty for him, right? So, um, but I think it's, it's, I've seen a lot of social media. I think it's all over the world. I think the name Messi, the jerseys, the, I think what the league has done with Apple and, you know, just in terms of marketability of, of, you know, getting it again all over. It's given the league a real push, which is something we all want to be part of and something that, you know, we're all proud to be here at this moment in time because there's not many players that, that come over this side of town and, and still offer the value and the contribution that he is um, giving at the moment. So, you know, uh, I hope it continues much longer, um, and and I hope it goes through till like 2026 after the World Cup because these are all just platforms for making sure that soccer in in North America uh, becomes a thing of of power of stature. You know, and that's something I'm looking forward to being part of and building together with with the MLS. You know. Coach, we always enjoy having you on the opening drive. Thanks so much for the time. Get them ready tomorrow against Atlanta, and then uh, we'll see you back here against Austin on the 20th. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. Enjoy the support. Thank you. Take care. That is uh, Bradley Carnell, the outstanding head coach of St. Louis City SC. And again, uh, scrimmage tomorrow against Atlanta United and then back in action at City Park against Austin FC a week from Sunday. I I like the idea of, I know that the fan support has been amazing, and I love that whole fan section. Maybe they should do, like, kind of hunting theme after he said that. That, Hunting the prey. Get me going. (laughs) There we go. Uh, So, speaking of hunting prey. (laughs) Oh, well done. No. (laughs) We need a fighter for the fight. Text in 314-399-646. 314-399. Text in with the word fight and your name, and perhaps Matthew will pick you as our fighter next next on 101 ESPN.
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga Heating and Cooling. The Cardinals take down the Rays two out of three games in their series with a 5 2 win yesterday. Matthew Libertor with a great start. Eight innings pitch, two hits, seven strikeouts, and the Cardinals are back in action today. They start a two game series against the Kansas City Royals down on the other side of I 70. It'll be Adam Wainwright facing off against Dylan Coleman. 7 10 first start, 7 10 first pitch for that game. That is your Sports Center update brought to you by Saliga. Uh, heating and cooling, an independent American standard heating and air conditioning dealer. Welcome to the fight in the red corner, average Joe listener, and in the blue corner, the undisputed king of morning drive. Please welcome Randy. Welcome back to the opening drive. I'm Kerry Davis, joined by Brooke Grimsley, and it is time for the fight. And our fighter today is Ryan. Ryan, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Kerry. All right. Now, Ryan, I see your uh, your text here and said uh, we're scared. Oh. And you said Randy don't want to lose. Oh. So challenging you, obviously, is going to send Randy into a, uh, a weekend where he's going to be thinking about it for a few days. What you're telling us? I hope so. I hope uh, so. You got to keep that confidence now. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's go for it. All right. Here we go, Ryan. Earlier this week, Pete Alonso became the first player since Albert Pujols to start their career with four 35-plus home run campaigns in the first five years of his career. The only players, the only other players to do it in Major League history are Eddie Matthews and which Pirates star? Is it Willie Stargell, Barry Bonds, or Ralph Kiner? Barry Bonds. The Cardinals are sharing down the barrel of their first 90 loss season since 1978 when the Cardinals burned through three managers. Which skipper finished out the season? Was it Jack Kroll, Kim Boyer, or Vern Rapp? I'm going to say Boyer. Which school has the most Rose Bowl victories in, the Big Ten, in Big Ten history? Is it Michigan State, Michigan, or Ohio State? Oh, I don't know college at all. I'm going to say... Uh, Michigan. Michigan. Which Hall of Fame pitcher was the last L.A. Dodger to have played in Brooklyn? Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, or Don Sutton? Can you repeat the question, please? Which Hall of Fame pitcher was the last L.A. Dodger to have played in Brooklyn? Don Drysdale, Sandy Koufax, or Don Sutton? Uh, let's go uh, Koufax. All right, we'll double-check our score, and we will bring in Randy Carricker. Ryan, how you feel? Not great. No? Not feeling wonderful? Oh, oh Randy is coming in. He, oh, he's got his oh. what color propel. Is that grape? Oh, that is grape. He's got his grape propel, and he's going to take a swig before he uh, sits on down and gets ready to talk to you. Right here, Randy, say hello to Ryan. Ryan, good morning. How you doing? Doing great, doing great. Glad to be on the show. Well, Excellent. thank you very much. We appreciate you participating. Thanks for listening. Thanks for playing. All right, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Ryan was talking a little crap. Good for him. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All right. Yeah, talk. <laughs> and then I, I would assume that he took the options. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean they're given to him, Randy. That's, uh, kinda, you, that's you how the game say, works. Uh, no, you can you can say you can decline the options if you want to talk smack. You can decline the options. Oh, oh sorry, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier this week, Pete Alonso became the first player since Albert Pujols to start their career with four 35 plus home run campaigns in their first five years. The only other players to do it in Major League Baseball history are Eddie Matthews and which Pirates star? Which Pirates star? I'm assuming it was Ralph Kiner. I'll go with Ralph Kiner. The Cardinals are staring down the barrel of their first 90 loss season since 1978. Ouch. When the Cardinals burned through three managers, which skipper finished out the season? So, uh, 1978, that would have been Vern Rapp, Jack Kroll for a game or two, and then Ken Boyer. How does that work? Interim manager. Jack Kroll was just in an interim. (laughs) Who's your answer? I'm sorry. Uh, Ken Boyer. Okay. Just checking. Just making sure. And then he was uh, fired during 1980. And ironically, when Ken Boyer was fired between games of a doubleheader in Montreal, the interim manager was Jack Kroll. Oh. Same guy. Wow. Hmm. 
Which school had... The Mighty Herzog did not finish that season out. Red Shane Deans did in 1980. Oh, okay. Which school has the most Rose Bowl victories in the Big, in Big Ten history? Big Ten history. Um, the first thought is Illinois. <laughs> that's a solid thought the there. First thought. That, that would be that's that, the first that, one. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> if it were me, clearly. Okay. I-L-L. I L L. I and I. There you go. Uh, it's got to be either Michigan or Ohio State because they're the ones. And I am going to go with the Buckeyes. Which Hall of Fame pitcher was the last LA Dodger to have played in Brooklyn? Hmm. Okay, so uh, this would be late 60s then. Drysdale pitched until like 68, I think. It wasn't Koufax. He retired after 65 with the bad arm. I don't think Don Sutton played in Brooklyn. See, he played in 88. No, he wasn't with the 88 team. Let's see. I don't think that he was in Brooklyn. I'll do the lifeline. I'm going to think Drysdale, but I'll take the lifeline. Okay. Your options are Sandy Koufax, nope. Don Drysdale, Maybe. or Don Sutton. Oh, lovely. I gave this a... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just figure that out Don Sutton's career down. here. Uh, Don Sutton played for 24 years. He played against the Cardinals in the 82 World Series, but he was with Milwaukee. So would he have played 58... 68, 78. No, there's no way that Don Sutton could have played in Brooklyn. So I am going to go with Don Drysdale. Final answer. All right, Randy. So this is, I'm not, I'm not writing fight questions for Monday. We're going to have Bradford Bruns, oh, who's, good. who's incredible at that. You yeah. said, he's oh, gonna, good. He's going to jump in on Bradford Bruns. <laughs> so, <laughs> because Bradford Bruns, but Carrie will enjoy Bradford Bruns' questions. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> so, the question is, am I coming back here on Tuesday <laughs> with a round of questions and a Hall of Fame on the line? Stay in Denver. Does Ryan oh. 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 Or does Randy Carricker take him out on Friday and go into the weekend happy? Ring that bell. Go crazy, folks. Go crazy. The winner and still champion of the fight, Randy Carricker. The fight is presented by Golf Discount of St. Louis with the most experienced club fitters in town. Why shop anywhere else? Oh, man. <laughs> Ryan, I'm sorry you heard Jack Buck, and that means Randy Carricker hit the jack. He got all four correct, and he beat you four to one today. That's too bad. I'll have to get him next time. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Always next time, Ryan. Let's go, th- let's go through those ones. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go through the questions. Earlier this week, Pete Alonso became the first player since Albert Pools to start their career with four 35-plus home run campaigns in their first five years. Obviously, the 2020 campaign, the only one that Pete Alonso didn't get it in. The only other players to do that in MLB history are Eddie Matthews and, in fact, Ralph Kiner in his first five years with the Pirates. The Cardinals are staring down the barrel of their first 90 loss season since 1978. It was, in fact, Vern Rapp opens up with a 7-11 and record. Jack Kroll goes 1-1, one and one, and then Ken Boyer takes over and finishes out that season. Want a little fun fact? Go for it. Uh, Vern Rapp apparently told Ted Simmons, who was the Cardinals' perennial all-star and is now a Hall of Famer, that Ted Simmons was a loser. Ted Simmons relays this to Jack Buck. Jack Buck goes on the air and says, Vern Rapp said Ted Simmons was a loser. And then Vern Rapp got fired like a week later. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah, that's rough. That's some juice when you, Jack, that was big. Uh, which school has the most Rose Bowl victories in Big Ten history? It is, in fact, Ohio State. They have nine to Michigan State's eight. By the way, USC has 25 Rose Bowl mm-hmm. wins. How many uh, does Illinois have? Uh, I was actually going to ask you that. Do you know how many appearances the, the Illinois has in the Rose Bowl? Oh, 
I want to say five or six. They have five. They are three and two in those appearances in the Rose Bowl. And which Hall of Fame pitcher was the last L.A. Dodger to have played in Brooklyn? It was, in fact, Don Drysdale, who outlasted Sandy Koufax and was there uh, about a decade before Mr. Don yeah. Sutton would come around. So a 4-1 win for Randy Carricker in the fight today. Ryan, thank you so much for joining the fight and joining the show. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> you, you knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Wow. <laughs> that is hilarious. That yeah. is a great moment. I just, you know, it's, hey, you know, they, they come on and they, they and they talk smack. <laughs> For those on the YouTube, he just played Taylor Swift. He had a Swifty moment. I did. Swifty, yeah. And unleashed all his other celebration songs. Yeah, well, it's, you know, it's, it is what it is. Yeah, that, that, at the end of the day, somebody predicted it years ago. We are about to hear every drop that Randy has. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you know what? I, I'm not gonna. Well, here, here's what I'll do. I'll just. Yeah. Mm. You, you you take pride in this, Randy, I, and I think people did, should did know. Did he really that. talk smack, or were you just saying? No, he, 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 no, he oh, said. No, 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 no. no he, he said. Did. Randy don't. Yeah. Randy. Randy is. Uh, um, fight Ryan. Y'all are scared. I know it. Randy don't want to lose. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, he really doesn't. He, that is true. Yeah, no, that's because he's not. And they're right. Yeah. Not going to lose. No, it's, well, uh, I'm, here's the thing. I, I used to be afraid, but now. <laughs> so that's, that, that's my motivation. Every day. Mm-hmm. To, to win the fight. And I, you know, it's so, uh, sometimes I. I, I like to take on young people and, and like Ryan and, and beat them, the youths. <laughs> Has Ryan ever done this before? What by is the way? a youth? Did, was, did Ryan ever play before today? Uh, by, the, by my count, he had not played in the last two years. Okay. So his winning percentage is still. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Oh, I've been mean enough heading into the weekend. Oh, we do have the here. bird watch coming up here on 101 ESPN. And the Cardinals won last night, so it is a watch. It's not a dropping. It's the opening drive on 101 ESPN.
the field to give you the latest on your St. Louis Cardinals. This is Bird Watch on the opening drive. Time for the Bird Watch here on 101 ESPN, and let's get started with Brooke. My bird watch, bottom of the order really coming up big for the Cardinals last night. Specifically, I want to look at Andrew Kisner and his hot stretch that he's had. Seven-game hitting streak, uh, as we saw last night. Two for four, two-run homer. That was his ninth home run of the season. In 13 games since July 1st, and we're talking about specifically in this stretch, 365 average, four home runs, 14 RBI, OPS of 1,000, and that's since July 1st. He's hit new career highs in home runs, RBI, and as I mentioned, that seven-game hitting streak. Andrew Kisner has just taken a major step forward this season despite having to balance time with not only Wilson Contreras, who is your DH, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) As Randy likes to say, your DH, uh, and sometimes catcher, but also with Yvonne Herrera and him coming up at certain points in the season. It's been really amazing to see that Andrew Kisner has been able to balance that time and not really let it affect his play where we're seeing these career highs. The thing is, is that I think he's such an essential part of this team. It's just going to be interesting to see how the Cardinals handle this whole catching situation moving forward and how much value they put behind that because you even look at Matthew Libertor last night and the just camaraderie that he has with the pitchers. He obviously worked under Yadier Molina. Andrew Kisner is not Yadier Molina, but still saw how Yadi handled things with pitchers. And you can tell amongst the group that he has such a great rapport with the pitching staff and they listen to him. One time when Mike Matheny was off to a bad offensive start, Tony La Russa went to him and said, look, you don't have to get hit, hit all year. You just catch. You just mm-hmm. run the pitching staff. That's what you're here for. That's what you're best at. And Kisner is really, really good. And he, clearly he paid attention to what was going on when Yadi was here. But he's really, really good at relating to a staff. Just that one cut that he – can we play that cut again this morning, the one that, where he talked to Libertor? Uh, Kisner number one, if we can hear. This is quintessential catcher. I mean, he was – untouchable tonight i mean that was about as good as you can pitch but that's how he can pitch every night and um you know we talked before the game and i told him i said dude your stuff is elite just challenge these hitters do whatever you can challenge these guys get strike one go right after him trust your stuff and he did that tonight i mean he was he was unhittable and and mixing pitches can't say enough that was outstanding so i'm not even going to talk about Wilson Contreras here because I don't know but I do know that that's the sort of thing the pitchers love is to have their confidence built up and they they love to have a guy that's fully engaged in their performance yeah I mean he did it he, he's doing a great job and he's hitting the ball really well he's he's mm-hmm. his batting average is as high as it's ever yeah. been in his career he's got the most home runs he's had uh in a season is in this year so he's he's doing really well that was the one thing that you talked about you didn't think he could hit. But he, he, he was drafted well as a hitter. He, yeah. he was a third baseman. So he's yeah. uh, he's providing you know good depth in that and in that second catcher's role, and also hitting the, hitting the ball really well when he gets his opportunities. I'm gonna go with Matthew Libertor, and I, we, this is a, a, a guy that we obviously have been waiting to see. Randy, you talked about his, uh, his velocity when he's in the minors in comparison to what he is in the majors, and last night was a great outing for him. Eight innings pitch, 101 pitches thrown, seven strikeouts, no walks, which is to me probably the most key stat on there. No walks, only two hits allowed in the game, and you know for him to be able to go out there and perform at the level that he was doing, they were talking about his curveball, how well he was throwing that. You heard the the cut from Kisner talking about how good his stuff was last night. Just going out and trusting yourself is an important thing as a as a professional player. Once you build up that trust, once you build up that confidence, you already have the talent. We've seen the talent there. It's frustrating when you don't see it on a consistent basis, but what you saw last night should give you hope for what the future can hold for the Cardinal staff and for Matthew Libertor. Absolutely. And I'm uh, it's going to change every day for me when these if they keep pitching well with uh with Libertor and Zach Thompson, it's going to be recency bias for me all the way, who I like is the number five starter for next mm-hmm. year. But the Cardinals obviously have the big investment in Libertor. I have to believe that because of his size and because of, of the velo and because of the, how he was regarded even when they got him and because of what they gave up, 
I would think that the Cardinals would be pretty enthusiastic about Matthew Libertor being a starter. Yeah, I, I would too. It, it'll be interesting to see how it plays off, uh, plays out, and hopefully he can build off of it. John Denton of MLB.com had this great little tidbit in a tweet last night. It was the first time he's finished the eighth inning at any level of baseball. He pitched into the eighth last year, I think, in Triple A, into the eighth. But this is the furthest that he's been able to do that at any level, uh, any level in baseball. So that that's huge. Yes. And, and the fact that they let him do it. Yeah. It, it seems like the management has kind of changed here since the deadline, too. Because Are they, they really, listening to us? Yeah. We, <laughs> either that or they're listening to Jordan Montgomery. Yeah. Less, <laughs> less, less pressure yeah. applied mm. at this point of the season. When you are... When you don't have, uh, and with all due respect, mm-hmm. we don't have anything to play for as the Cardinals are right now. They're, they're not vying for an NL Central title. They're not working to to make it into the playoffs. They're playing with house money right now. So you can really do as you feel and feel confident, win, lose, or draw, that it's going to work out for you. Guys, one of the things that I really like about this stretch run where the Cardinals evaluate people is not only – Getting, giving a guy like Libertor an opportunity to to go into an eighth inning, but also giving a guy like JoJo Romero multiple opportunities over the course of time. He pitched on August 2nd. He pitched on August 6th. He pitched on August 9th. And then last night he got a back-to-backer. I love the fact that they're going to find out whether or not hopefully more than just Romero, are capable of going back-to-back out of the bullpen. They've had too many guys over the course of this season out of the bullpen that they couldn't pitch back-to-back. Now, did Romero turn in a great performance last night? No, an inning, two hits, a couple of runs. He walked one and struck out one, but we're finding out about him. And that's more important to me than the result is next year when Jojo Romero is in your bullpen, how often can you anticipate being able to use him? And they're doing that by pitching him in back-to-back games last night. You can learn something about 2024 with what you do in 2023. Exactly. And somebody from the 3 and 4 just texted this in, kind of playing off of that. This is early spring training for the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. You're able to evaluate things. You're able to see what you can do with JoJo Romero and see what things that you could even have him work on. This is this does feel like a very early start to spring training for 2024 season of the Cardinals. And by the way, Romero, in his other back-to-back, he pitched on the 24th and the 25th of July, and in both of those out he went to an inning and allowed a couple of runs on a couple of hits. So maybe that's maybe that's telling about Romero. I don't know, but I hope that over the course of the last couple of months, he gets a couple of other opportunities to go uh, back to back and, and see what he can do. Yeah, because he's had to he had to wait a lot too with everything mm-hmm. that was figuring out with this bullpen situation, and it really opened the door. Of course, you don't want the injury with Ryan Helsley, and everybody's going to be happy for his return. But that injury, and then you move away from Jordan Hicks, that finally gives him more of a time to really see what he has and showcase that for the Cardinals. Is there a relief pitcher among the entire group? that you want to see more of or see put into a particular situation? Oh, I, I, JoJo Romero was the one for me that I think you want to see repeatedly uh, over and over again, kind of see what he has because of the, his his style, his temperament. I, I really enjoyed that. I don't need to see much of Andre Pallante. With I'm with you respect. there. Uh, are, are we Hagen, already? Is that ship uh, sailed? Is that what we're saying? I just don't know. I, I, I don't know. Drew Bergen's not going to be here I, next year. I, I don't know that John King. You don't want to even see. He's a, he's a free agent. We don't need to. T- I, I don't know that John King is. I, I don't. I mean, I don't know that I need to really see him. Difficult. It's, this is quite a transition. It's I think not, you need to pitch him a lot. Yeah. Leaving CNN to go to pitch in the major leagues. It's, you know. That's, Leave. It's a pretty it's not, no 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 it's not it's, not, it's, it's a different John King. Oh. oh I didn't I didn't know I just you assumed didn't. I just assumed that, that no was, that's John King this is John, John King oh okay it's John Thank you, King do we do we Andrew Suarez do we know yeah. anything about him do we do we he had a great spring he's pitched in the bigs with San Francisco and was good but is I, that I, I, I'm you know you got 50 games left or whatever whatever give him an opportunity let let's see what he's got. I, I mean, I don't. I, none of the names really jump off of the screen for me as as guys that I need to see. JoJo Romero was one because I think he's going to be in this bullpen next year as a seventh or eighth inning guy. We know what uh, Gallegos is. We we are confident, good, batter, you know, whatever you think about him, you know what he is. I I guess you got to see some of these guys just to get an idea or a feel for who they are. Yeah. By yeah. the way, speaking of lefty relievers, I brought up JoJo Romero. Uh, 
10 appearances for Henesis Cabrera in a uh, Toronto Blue going? Jays uniform. He's allowed to run in one of those 10 appearances. Oh, okay. It'd be nice to have mm-hmm. that here, huh? All yeah, right. yeah, he's pretty good. Uh, since he and the, the one outing, they got rocked. He came into a game that they were going to lose anyway. He allowed three runs in an inning. Since then, an inning against Baltimore, obviously scoreless, where he struck out two. An inning against uh, Boston, obviously scoreless, where he struck out one. A scoreless inning against Cleveland, another scoreless inning against Cleveland, and another scoreless inning against Cleveland. As a matter of fact, Hennis has pitched on the 7th, 8th, and 10th. For Toronto against Cleveland, Seven, three scoreless eight, outings in four days. That's three days in a row, right? Yeah, uh, three out Seven, of four. Seven, eight, three out of four, huh? Hmm. Seven, eight, and, ten. And an inning in each. know that he oh. can do that. Hennessy, yeah, congrats. Congrats. Good, good for him. Mm. Coming up next on 101 ESPN, we've got our Rush Hour Reset, and then at 9.15, we're going to talk to Chip Carey, Cardinals TV voice on Bally Sports. Hey, we've got some great stuff happening in St. Louis, including the IndyCar Series coming back to Worldwide Technology Raceway on Saturday, August 26th, and Sunday, August 27th. If you like watching the cars and stars of the Indy 500, they're coming here to St. Louis for their last oval race of the season. They'll be pushing 200 miles an hour down the straightaways, getting just a few inches off the wall and battling wheel to wheel. It's simply amazing. On Saturday, you can catch IndyCar practice and qualifying along with the Outfront Showdown for the Indy Next Series, live music, and an incredible car show on the midway and then on sunday 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 it's the bomberito automotive group 500 for indy cars but the day kicks off with rumble before the roar pre-race party vintage indy cars more music and a huge corvette car show plus this year the usac silver crown series battle it out for 100 miles just before the big race. It's a great weekend of racing, broadcast to a massive worldwide audience. You need to be there. Get your tickets at www.raceway.com, brought to you in part by Discover Downstate Illinois and the Illinois Office of Tourism.
recap the biggest sports stories of the day on the opening drive with a Rush Hour Reset. Brought to you by Clubhouse Turf, your exclusive partner of Celebrity Greens. We're redefining private golf. Nine oh six in St. Louis. Your time check brought to you by Clarkson Jewelers, an officially licensed Rolex jeweler. Brooke Grimsley, Kerry Davis, Randy Carricker. Great to have you with us. And uh, you can always watch us on the YouTube. Just go to YouTube.com <laughs> and uh, go to 101 ESPN STL. What are you kids laughing at? Oh, nothing. <laughs> oh, nothing. Nothing's happening. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> <We're> just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just just things on the tube. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you kids. You crazy kids. Cardinals were winners last night, 5-2 in Tampa. The story of the game was Matthew Libertor, the former Rays farmhand, going eight scoreless innings. He allowed two hits, struck out seven, and did not walk a hitter. Libertor on how it felt to perform against the Rays. First time seeing these guys. I know you were exciting, excited about it. How good did that feel? Uh, felt awesome. Um, you know, I just went out with the plan to pitch my game. I didn't try and do too much, and uh, you know, I had confidence with my stuff in the zone tonight, and I think it made a big difference. Matthew with 101 pitches, 70 of them for strikes. His best big league outing. You could argue his best professional outing. He was terrific. Oh, my God. I, I yeah. agree. Eight innings pitched, 101 pitches thrown, no walks. Seven strikeouts, two hits. That is, that's the, the the type of night you look forward to having every time you get on the mound. And if he can, you know, kind of repeat that success, maybe not to that degree because that would make him, I guess, a Hall of Famer at some point. Yeah. If you do that every night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that is the the. Once you know you can do it, and that's the thing about about confidence, especially I keep I keep talking about being a younger player, really kind of learning yourself, learning the game. It's one of the toughest things to do, but once you do it and do it well enough, your confidence goes through the roof. So next time he goes out there, he should feel, you know, I can do this at this level. I can be really good at this level. Now, the game is going to humble you. You're going to get slapped around from time to time, and you're going to go out, and, but how do you respond? Each time, it's about how you respond. Do you do you respond with the mindset that I'm going to have the best outing my next outing? And, and if you do, you, you'll be okay. Exactly, and he's 23 years old. I, we keep having to remind people of that myself of that mm -hmm. because I think we expect you know we're a microwave society we want to see instant results we want to see as soon as that trade happens where you see Randy or Rose Arena kind of rising into a star you want to see Matthew Libertor do the exact same thing at the exact same time with Libby I think this was as you mentioned CD just very encouraging to know that he can do this that that potential is there and hopefully can build off it because he's young and also in that first inning 26 pitches and he was able to really just settle in right after that getting to 101 pitches I'm glad that they kept him in that game and let him get to that eighth inning, through that eighth inning. And here's one thing for, for Cardinal fans to keep in mind. Randy Rosarina is 28 years old. He just went to his first All-Star game. He was the ALCS MVP. Mm -hmm. That's one series where he had a really good series. That's how you win that, obviously. He was Rookie of the Year. That's that's very good for, for the pool of rookies. But keep in mind that, as you just said, Brooke, Matthew Libertor is 23 years old. He still has plenty of time to catch up and close that gap that Randy Rosarina has already set in front of him. It's We're looking at Randy Rosarina, obviously, and we're, we're frustrated because we see, as Greg said earlier, we got four fourth outfielders, um, but and Randy Rosarina would clearly be a one, but Again, there's time for the, for for Matthew Libertor to close that gap and really put his foot down and gra and put some roots down in this in this league. I love this perspective. It's always so intriguing to me because if 24-year-old Dylan Carlson were in AAA tearing it up, we'd be clamoring yeah. for him to be up here. Oh my God, and now yeah. people can't wait to get rid of him. <laughs> You know, <laughs> because he's in the major leagues, they can't wait to get rid of him. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. Hopefully he can build off this. It was also just another side note. I thought it was such a great thing to see. I, I hope a lot of people were happy that Libby was able to do that. But seeing that reaction, the dugout, and then when he when he was in the dugout, everybody was hugging him, all mm -hmm. the smiles. That was just a great moment. Well, and Andrew Kisner was just back there catching it because everything was working. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we pitched the report, um, but then we got off the report a little bit because he was feeling some different pitches and different counts. And um, 
you know, that was just, like I said, I mean, he had everything working. Fastball, curveball, slider, changeup, sinker, moving in and out, up, down. I mean, he had those guys totally off balance all night. Did he say we went off the report? Yes. Ooh. Wait a minute. Now, you can't do that in baseball. You can't. They, analytics tell you what you're supposed to do. You can't. You can't do that. Well, and you then there's like he, a two he, o'clock he, meeting he, that they have he, to. No. Yeah. Wait, no. Wait, see, he did that, and he no. Is did, it, did you guys see the story the about how uh, Mike Vrabel is having Terrell Williams be the yes. head coach? I, Ollie must have turned it over to somebody else last night. <laughs> <laughs> the players? Yeah. Uh, how do you feel about throwing this pitch in this count? I don't feel really good. Okay, don't throw it. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. That's I amazing. That. So the Cardinals win it uh, by a score of 5-2 over Tampa. They take two of three from the Rays, and they take on the Kansas City Royals tonight and tomorrow in KC. And uh, if you have not been keeping up with the Royals and – you're reasonable to not. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, do you want yeah. to? The, the Cardinals sure. can force them into an official losing season this weekend. Nice. They're 37 and 80, so they probably are not going to have a winning season because once you get to 82, you aren't going to have a winning season. Yeah. But uh, 37 and 80 is uh, kind of scuffling. I-, I told you. What, what Kansas City is saying, well, we're, we're scuffling, but the Cardinals are coming. Well, you know, Kansas City, <laughs> they're saying that, and they, they're saying... Uh, let's take a look across the, the the parking lot here. Let's let's just watch number fifteen. We're good. Uh, we were, Randy, we were laughing earlier because there's a lot of people on the on the text line saying, "What are they saying?" What do you got, Matthew? Oh, on the oh, yeah. YouTube on, chat. On the YouTube, YouTube chat, because they're very angry because the uh, computer that Brooke uses to read the text line and things like that was covering up a part. <laughs> Of her face, of her face and, and, and so, were, so I, I, yeah, we we audibly heard it. Your face. We want to see your face. <laughs> Who said that? You want to see my face? <laughs> <laughs> So here's the thing. When we come in in the mornings, like, uh, I think Danny Mac. We want to see your face. (laughs) Danny Mac was here, I think, yesterday where I where I was sitting and he moves. Everybody has the way that they like to position things. I don't like to touch and move things that much, but uh, some people wanted me to move it. So we 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 got it done because we love and listen to our listeners. They they sent the mic drop. That's what that was. (laughs) (laughs) That was direct. (laughs) Move it. Glad you moved it. Glad you moved it. Uh, Chip Carey is going to join us from KC next on 101 ESPN.
Jim Crimsley is here. Carrie Davis is here. I'm Randy Carricker, and we head across the state to our friend Chip Carey, the TV voice of the Cardinals on Bally Sports, getting ready for the Cards and Royals for a couple of games. And then Chip has that rare August Sunday off, maybe like the rarest of uh, Sundays off. I don't know if he's ever had a baseball Sunday off, but we'll find out right now. Chip, good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing great, guys. Good morning. Hey, what happened with the shortstop for Tampa Bay last night when he got picked off? Oh, he wandered too far off the bat. Come on, bro. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect. I love that call. <laughs> that was a layup. <laughs> <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> uh, uh, Chip, now, now I guess getting into uh, some Cardinals talk, uh, we were talking about Matthew Libertor and his performance last night and just seeing the reaction to from the dugout from the other players, just how happy they were and hugging him. What, did, what was your takeaway from his performance? Uh, he was great. Uh, there were so many layers to his performance last night. Again, we talked about it briefly during the game. Brad pointed out a lot of the uh, structural, mechanical usage things that have been going on in bullpens behind the scenes for things that the Cardinals hoped would carry over from bullpen work into the game. They did. Obviously, Matthew was a guy traded from Tampa Bay for Arosa Rain, and everybody in Cardinal Nation knows how great the start to Arosa Rain's career has been, and Matthew hasn't gotten that same kind of traction yet. To do that against that team is really, really good. Uh, to do it against a team the caliber of Tampa Bay, one that's going to probably make the playoffs if not win their division, was a huge step forward and as we keep talking on the broadcast too this is a group of players for the cardinals that we want to see growth we want to see guys take steps forward and take advantage of the opportunities that they've been getting we're seeing that out of the bullpen we saw that with dakota hudson and we certainly saw that with matthew libertor last night so uh, as hard as this kid has worked, as well as he's pitched in the minor leagues, there's really nothing left for him to prove at AAA to do it at the major league level on uh, a night like that with all those other factors thrown in was really, really cool to see, and we're all really happy for him. Chip, I was saying earlier that I think Cardinal fans need to, you know, kind of slow it down a little bit. Randy, Ro- Randy Rosarina is a one-time All-Star. He's 28 years old, and Matthew Libertor is 23. There's still time for him to close the gap in that trade and, and really surpass Randy Rosarina if he performs the way he did last night. I think that's a great point, Kerry, because it's a cautionary tale for all of us. We, we live in such an instant gratification world that we don't let the trades work out. We don't wait to see what uh, they turn into. We, we saw that the other day with uh, uh, the Minnesota Twins. Their closer came over in a deal for Eduardo Rodriguez five years ago. And uh, last year was the first year in the major leagues, and now he's one of the best closers in the major leagues, and he's throwing 104 miles an hour. Hmm. Part of that deal with with the Rays that everybody has to remember, and, and, and look, you're right about the age, and look, I hope Rose Arena has a great career, and we certainly hope Matthew does at 24, um, but there's another uh, component to it. There's a competitive balance pick that was in that deal that came to the Cardinals as well for Randy Rose Arena, and that young player is a man named Tank Hentz, hmm. and Tank is lighting things up at double A and is a phone call away from the major leagues next year. So uh, there aren't winners or losers in the trade the, the year or sometimes even the two years after the deal is made. you got to let them percolate and let the players develop. And the Cardinals took flyers on young pitchers in that trade for a Rosa Reina. And uh, here we go. Libertor with a terrific start. Now hopefully a foundational piece as he starts uh, hopefully a long run in rotation for the Cardinals. Chip Carey with us on 101 ESPN. And Chip, in addition to Libertor and Zach Thompson, they're going to get their starts down the stretch, and the Cardinals are taking a look at their outfield situation. I thought it was interesting last night, and it kind of flies under the radar, but Romero getting the opportunity to go back-to-back again. It seems like there's a lot of little things that maybe we don't think about that are taking place from an evaluation standpoint. With that as an example, with Romero pitching back-to-back, do you think that's one of the things that Ollie and the staff are looking at too? No question. I mean, these are auditions, and they're auditions within the realm of trying to win the games. Cardinals aren't just throwing 25, 26 guys out there to say, hey, let's compete, be competitive, and let's try to win in 2024. No, they want to win games. Uh, Adam Wainwright said it the other day. Miles Michaelis has said this, and maybe it sounds Pollyanna to uh, the casual fan in what's been a very disappointing year. Their goal is to get to 500, and maybe with a couple of weeks left, have a chance to impact the race, not only for the rest of the division, but themselves. Is that possible? Yes. Yes. Is that going to be very, very difficult to do? Oh, yes, it is. But the performances we're seeing from guys who are getting opportunities that they probably would not have had at the start of the year is really, really encouraging. And uh, the opportunity that Ollie has.
has to mix and match and see what guys he has now and for next year is really, really fun to watch too. And Romero is certainly at the top of the list. The guy's pitching with his hair on fire. And I think if you had to summarize what's happened for the Cardinals over the last four or five games has been the pitchers are on the ta- on the attack and they're getting after guys. And, and if you can hit it 96, hit it instead of nibbling and pitching to the edges. It's really been fun and exciting to watch. And I think it's a great template going forward. Chip, we also have been talking about today, Andrew Kisner and how great the season has been for him handling just the whole catching situation we've seen with the addition of Wilson Contreras and at times Yvonne Herrera being here. And he's been doing really well, especially with the seven game hitting streak. And I know you guys talked about since July 1st, his average 365 average, four home runs, 14 RBI, new career high in home runs and RBI. What have you thought of his progression? And as we look at and evaluate guys who are going to be coming and going during the offseason and possible trades, is that a, is that a guy, Andrew Kisner, all the value that he brings, especially just the camaraderie he has with the pitchers? Is that somebody that you say has to stay here? Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't, have, I don't know if I say that about any player because you just know, don't know what opportunities are going to be provided to you uh, with other players coming back in return. And look, I'm not the G. I don't make those decisions either. But I will say this: I've been very impressed with what Andrew has done. He was an unknown commodity to me because when you when we'd come in with the Braves and see the Cardinals, Yadier played every day. Uh, when you're compared as a young player to a guy that's going to the Hall of Fame, that's not an easy burden to uh, to carry as well. He's always hit in the minor leagues. He didn't hit in the major leagues until this year he's always been known as a catch it call it and throw it kind of catcher there's been no problems with that guys love throwing to him and so to see him make this next step in evolution and if you will in a complimentary way escape the shadow of Yadier Molina behind the plate is really really an amazing thing and it's again part of that transformation we're talking about guys are going to play themselves into or out of a team's plans in games like this when you're fighting like crazy just to get to 500 uh, all around the major leagues not just with the Cardinals and I think Brooke I would agree with you the way he's playing right now you'd look at him as being a guy that wow it'd be really hard to let him go so good for him hopefully it continues he had a great game yesterday and uh, i think everybody's really happy to see that kind of progress chip you talk about the starting pitchers and and wanting to see what they're going to do the 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 rest of the season what about the bullpen is there anyone in particular randy asked me this earlier is there anyone in particular that you want to see in that bullpen uh and how well they can perform down the stretch I want to see Dakota Hudson back. Uh, excuse me, that's Dakota Hudson. I want to see Ryan Helsley. I beg your pardon. Ryan Helsley come back. Uh, he pitched yesterday, I believe, gave up a home run. Uh, but I think for the Cardinals to be where they want to be next year, if Hicks isn't going to be here, they've got to have Helsley back and know what he is and know that he's healthy. The guy's immensely talented. He's an all-star. He knows how to close games. Uh, and having that kind of punch at the back of your bullpen with Giovanni Gallegos is going to be a really, really good thing. Then you can set things up, get one more guy to to uh, plug in as a you know lid Dotel Wagner kind of closing uh, trio. Uh, that's what the Cardinals envisioned at the start of this year. It just didn't work out for myriad reasons, including injury to uh, Ryan. But as he makes his way back, the Cardinals got to get him back and got to get him on a plan that makes him available more often than not. And when he is having an all-star closer, well, that's a big piece that you fill that you have within your system and don't have to go get. Chip, one of my favorite baseball trips is heading across the state. It's three and a half hours from my driveway to Kauffman Stadium and three 45 to uh, the hotel into downtown Kansas City. That's, uh, to me, one of my favorite weekend trips is to go to Kansas City for a Royals game where tickets generally are pretty well available, too. Yeah, it's a great place. I didn't get to come here all that often. When I did, it was with the Braves, and my partner, Joe Simpson, uh, played with the Royals. In fact, uh, the famous Pine Tar game, you'll see Joe Simpson is a man that's holding George Brett back from killing the umpire at the <laughs> stadium. Uh, but the stadium is beautiful. The fans are passionate. You guys know there's nothing quite like the, the joy of Midwestern baseball. And while the Royals aren't having a particularly good year this year, and they've seemingly been in rebuild for a long time, they've got a lot of excitement around their team, a lot of good young players. They're trying to get a new downtown ballpark built. They have new ownership that's engaged, new front office leadership. And uh, look, at the great thing about uh, baseball are the rivalries. And who knows, maybe the Cardinals and Royals are building a, a true rivalry, not one based out of geography, but one that's based on really good competitive play with fantastic fan bases and stadiums and all the, the things that come along with that. I'm looking forward to being out here a little more often, and uh, hopefully we can keep the good times rolling up at the end of this road trip tonight. And Brooke wants to know if you're a brunch guy with Sunday off. Hmm. Uh, well, if you've seen me, yes, you know I like to eat. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it's going to be it's, it's going to be a wild time for me. I, I'm off the Oakland series too. Tom Ackerman's going to be working, so I'll have stay through Wednesday off. I don't know what the heck I'm going to do with myself, but I 
be at the ballpark uh, checking out the, the Cardinals and the A's. So we'll look forward to seeing you guys there. Chip, football season is approaching. You got a you got a pick for a Super Bowl contender. Uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars are going to win the Super Bowl. Ooh. I live in St. Augustine, so and my wife went to Clemson. She's a big Trevor Lawrence fan. It must be the hair. And uh, <laughs> I'm guessing the, uh, the the Georgia Bulldogs, my alma mater, they will win the uh, national championship again. So That's it's going to be mm. good for us. Yeah. yeah. Well, good the calls. Jaguars got to get through the juggernaut that is the Tennessee Titans. Yeah. So uh, That's true. I don't yeah. know about that, Chip. <laughs> we, can, we can make a wager off air. We can figure yeah. that out. I like this. <laughs> Love it. Chip, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. We'll be tuned in tonight and tomorrow and uh hopefully we'll see you at the ballpark against the A's next week okay Randy thanks so much y'all have a great weekend take care Chip Carey the TV voice of the Cardinals on Valley Sports on 101 ESPN coming up one time I was told recently that the only way that Congress will take a look at NIL is when the S- IRS gets involved well guess what the IRS has gotten involved <laughs> that's next on 101 ESPN
This is Rocky with your Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff Chevrolet and Johnny Londoff Autoplex. The Cardinals yesterday 5 2 win over the Rays as they take that series. Matthew Libertor, eight innings pitched, two hits, and seven strikeouts in his game. Cardinals back in action today, starting a two game series against the Kansas City Royals. It will be Adam Wainwright facing off against Dylan Coleman. Coleman from Potosi, Missouri, getting the start for the Kansas City Royals. You want to hear more cards talk? You can head over to 101 ESPN and our Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers podcast later today to hear voice of the Cardinals, Chip Carey, talking it over. Also, Greg Amsinger joined the show earlier talking all things Cardinals and MLB. And also, St. Louis City SC head coach Bradley Carnell joined Kerry, Brooke, and Randy earlier to talk about the scrimmage coming up against Atlanta United and break down the new players acquired in the transfer window. All that again on 101 ESPN and the Dobbs Tire and Auto Centers podcast. That is our Sports Center update, driven by Johnny Londoff. Find your roads and shop 24 7 at Londoff.com and LondoffAutoplex.com. Are you kidding me? Sports, somebody's always got an angle, and the foundation that supports Texas A&M Athletics announced that it's closing the branch set up for donors to support endorsement deals for Aggie athletes, an effort that has been that has pushed the boundaries of how closely a school's traditional fundraising and booster groups could get involved in payments to the players. Now, here's what happened. The 12th Man Foundation is sold as a nonprofit, and it says it will still engage in name image and likeness activities with aggies athletes using quote-unquote unrestricted donations but it noted external advisors recommended shutting down the 12th man fund which had been just launched in february the foundation cited a june memo from the internal revenue service that said nonprofit collectives that were created primarily to pay players are likely not exempt from taxes, meaning donations would likely not be tax deductible. That's the angle that Texas A&M was trying to take is, okay, we're going to pay the players, but then we're going to write it off <laughs> as essentially employees. And it really doesn't work that way. Yeah. And I Is wonder, that a charity? You don't think it's a charitable effort to no, do that? No, not really. No. No. Okay. They, they were trying to yeah. make it that way. Yeah, they were. <laughs> trying to skirt around the rules. And I don't know how many collectives are set up as 501c3s, but I would have to believe at some point that there will have to, and there already has been discussion among college athletics and Congress about NIL and how it should be and if it should be policed. And at some point, somebody's going to have to get their arms around this, whether it's from an, a collective standpoint, people essentially trying to to take taxpayer dollars, right, to mm -hmm. pay players. That's a, that, At the foundation, that's what it is. Or just having a setup where there is a level of equality for schools that one school can't pay 100% more than another school's paying. And, and Texas A&M was one of the highest paid football programs in terms of NIL deals in the country. They were paying players. That's the whole rift that Nick Saban had with um, Jimbo, uh, Fisher. Jimbo Fisher yeah. saying, hey, you, they're, they're paying their guys. And they were. And the, it says here on ESPN, the fund was set up, was seen as a trailblazing effort to bring an NIL collective under the umbrella of a major athletic booster program. It was was pitched as a way for Aggie fans to directly support NIL deals for athletes and and earn points from the foundation for various perks such as event tickets and parking. So if you are paying, they're basically paying pay for play. They're paying these guys, and hey, we'll pay however much you want. Give us give us some perks, give us some tickets, give us some 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 preferential treatment and we'll get everybody in here that you want, which again, I guess is uh Deemed as unfair in comparison to other programs. I wonder if the NCAA is just like eating this news up because I firmly believe that they didn't want the NIL to be successful anyway. And oh, no. you have all these different regulations and stuff like that. They want these things to happen to kind of prove their point of there needs to be more regulation. And it might get to the point where you do need more government insight in this. And the sad uh. thing is, is that the NCAA had the opportunity to reach an agreement, but they wanted to take this to court and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and that's why we have the the craziness that we have now, because the NCAA could have put a lid on this and said, okay, here's the way NIL is going to work. All they had to do was, was agree with Ed O'Bannon's lawsuit people. But they and didn't they, want to. They exactly. didn't want to give anything. They nope. thought that they were going to win, yeah. and they didn't think that there was any way that things would get out of control 
the way they have, and they have. And, and it is out of control. I mean, you, you, you. When it first started, uh, programs were told to stay out of it. They, you can't assist. You can't help the players in any way. And then you realize, oh, if we don't help them, these kids are going to be filing, missing out on taxes, and and having some mm-hmm. tax evasion issues coming down the line. Don't want that attached to our program. Maybe we should put something together, a collective, so that we can help them. And it's really th- there is no rhyme or reason. There's really no answer for how. Who can do what until, I guess, Texas A&M was like, well, since there are no rules, we'll, we'll do whatever the hell we feel like. I wonder if there will reach a point where Bob's Chevrolet in Alabama, where, where Bob will have access to the quarterback. And Bob is a compulsive gambler. And Bob <laughs> has provided a, a nice vehicle to whatever quarterback, okay? So you know what? Can you throw a pick for me this weekend? I'll, I'll, give, yeah. you I'll, I'll give you $100,000 extra if you'll throw a pick for me this weekend. And it doesn't matter. Just a, just throw just an one, interception. One interception. You, you Now you're That's, getting into a, yeah. a scary part of money, gambling, and, and, and sports. And you've opened wide yeah. access for Bob's Cadillac owner to be have total access yeah. to the quarterback at State U. I'm just going to throw out something. Do you think that that, I think that NIL definitely brings more of these situations to light where we actually can see it unfold more and know who's involved. But at the same time, don't you think a lot of this stuff has been going on behind the scenes? I mean, somebody even point out the Johnny Manziel documentary we talked a little bit about it the other day, just hearing the stories of what he told about the money that he was getting at Texas A&M, not to spoil everything, but I am going to say a little bit of a spoiler. We were talking about it, Rocket I the other day is that he basically made up the whole story that he came from oil money. Right. He was getting so much money coming in. He was getting so much money coming in from stuff from behind the scenes of money that he was getting from people that they were making up this whole story so that they could justify all this spending and all this flow of cars and stuff. I think a lot of this stuff has been going There's on no behind doubt, the Brooke, scenes. It has, but the, the, the key is, is it was happening behind the scenes. Now, Bob's Cadillac owner can bring Johnny QB from State U out to his post-game tailgate party yeah. and sit mm-hmm. and watch other games on TV and say, well, what do you think of that? What yeah. do you think of that? Hey, what can you do for me? Yeah. And, and it's all out there in the open. I, I, I mean, you know, it, it's that's part of sports as always has been. As a player, you have to make sound decisions and not decide to do that. I mean, you've seen a couple mm-hmm. of players in college. Iowa State had a yeah. quarterback. Was it the quarterback, backup yeah. quarterback a couple of weeks ago? You, you have some of these things. We all have heard about Pete Rose and, and the things that happened with him in his playing career and why he's not in the Hall of Fame. So as a player, you have to make good decisions even when there's a large amount of money on the line. And hopefully they continue to do that because – it could go bad really fast. And that, that's the thing mm-hmm. is, depending on how much money is out there, $100,000 for the owner of Bob's Cadillac, probably not a big deal. But if you're getting 20000 in, in NIL and Bob's Cadillac owner says, okay, you got your Cadillac, but I'll give you an extra hundred grand," then all of a sudden you say, oh, well, it's just one interception. Yes, yeah. one. Could, I could easily that, see something like that happen. I'm reading a text from Janice saying, "I think getting, I think scholarships should be enough. Players shouldn't be paid." I couldn't disagree more. I agree with because you because the amount of money that is associated with these college programs for winning games, the college coaches getting. A, 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 a absurd amounts of money that they get, and the players are the ones that are doing all of the work. I mean, the coaches, obviously, they, they put in work, but the players are the ones out there playing football. And here's the thing that, that bothers me with that, that mindset is people think that everybody that plays college football goes to the NFL. There are people that I have been teammates with that have injuries sustained in college that impact them today. Mm -hmm. They didn't make hundreds of millions, tens of millions, hundreds of thousands of dollars in the NFL. I had a teammate that has lost, have lost things, sight, use of of, of certain uh, ligaments, uh, limbs. Those are things that stay with you for a long time because of this game. Yes, you get a scholarship. There are people on college campuses that don't play it down that get scholarships. 
and, 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 and can go make money. There's a great documentary, if you can find it, about the Fab Five. And Jalen Rose talked about how those guys who changed the game, they brought yep. long shorts into the game. Black socks. Yep. <laughs> and, and, yeah. and they're walking through this massive team store in Ann Arbor on the University of Michigan campus, and they're selling long shorts, and they're selling the jerseys with all their numbers on them, yep. and, the, and the black socks, and the players aren't getting a thing. But they, they are the ones that built this culture that allowed Michigan and Nike to sell all Correct. of this stuff, and they didn't get a penny for it. Yes, and also I think a lot of people get very fixated on the NIL stories where you're seeing these huge amounts of money that certain players are getting, are, are getting mm -hmm. and that's not everybody. Not everybody on every single campus is doing that. NIL also encompasses where, say, a softball player wants to use her name, image, and likeness to be able to host a camp. That was something that she could yeah, not do correct. prior. There's a lot more than just the star football players that I think people get really fixated mm -hmm. like, this is why we don't need to have it. There's a lot more. These athletes in so many different sports are finally able to control their name, image, and likeness. And if you're smart and, an, uh, and a go-getter and entrepreneurial, then you should be able to utilize and it to your the utmost. The Cavender twins yeah. who played college basketball. Was it Miami. Fresno State and then Miami? Yeah. And, and to to your point about the the Fab Five or anybody, when you are when you are someone is selling your name yeah. with your number in a store and you don't get any, any of it, yeah, yeah I think everybody'd be man. pretty upset. That's yeah. crazy. As yeah, hell. it was unbelievable. When Mizzou was number ridiculous. one, yeah. when Mizzou was number one, all the number ten jerseys, all the Chase Daniel jerseys mm. that were around, and everybody knew I, I got a Chase Daniel jersey, I got a Chase Daniel jersey, but he wasn't getting anything for it. And every yeah. study has shown that Mizzou's attendance went up then, and it has since continued to go up. And part of the reason, and, and you look at, yep. you can go to the 2013 success when they when they were going to the SEC championship game, attendance then got another bump up. That's that's money that isn't just jersey sales. That's money going to the university, and it's because of the success of athletics. If I'm not mistaken, I would have to ask to make sure, but I believe it was this was the case as of a couple of years ago that after 2007, when they were number one, was the most applications Missouri ever got for their institution, and it stayed that way for a long time, and it was directly attributable to football. I know for a fact by at least 2013 that had not changed. So uh, that's probably because in 2013, everybody's uh, Why? Uh, yeah. enrollment went down. Why do you think that everybody goes to the University of Alabama? There you go. Because of great education, Brooke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Alabama's a lot of fun. Alabama. Yeah, you can see Bob's Cadillacs Bam. down there. Bob's Cadillac. I was, <laughs> it, it is in Alabama, I guess. Uh, coming up, we've got rock and roll for you here on 101 ESPN. Have a neighbor who has a beautiful sunroom on the back of their house with a big screen and a giant ceiling fan. And then off of that sunroom, there's a little extension with a deck that has their grill on it. And it's incredible. And that sunroom used to be just a deck. And they had it turned into a sunroom by Chesterfield Fence and Deck. And it looks fantastic. And I'll tell you what, if you get in touch with Chesterfield Fence and Deck, there's so much that they can do for you. Obviously, their fences are great. They've been around for 55 years, and that's how they started in the fence business. And then they started doing cedar and vinyl decks, and they are fantastic. But now if you need a sunroom or a screen room or a pergola, well, Chesterfield Fence and Deck can help you out. You can find them on the web and see what they do at ChesterfieldFence.com, or you can give them a call at 800-300-4054. And at Chesterfield Fence and Deck, they're going to come out to your house. They're going to provide you 
all of the measurements necessary, and then a free, no-obligation project design that's going to look fantastic. Tell them Randy sent you and get a 20% discount on what you have done by Chesterfield Fence and Deck, but the sunroom is incredible. They'll show you pictures of what they've done, give you some ideas about what you can have done, and you're going to have a fantastic experience with Chesterfield Fence and Deck, the sign you've got the very best. And roll. Let's rock. Let's rock today. It is time for rock and roll. I'm doing my uh, football immaculate grid here. So How's that going? Uh, uh, so far, so good. Let us know if you need Are any you help. Are you obsessed? Let's let us know if you need any help. Am I obsessed? Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of. With the immaculate grid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. Kind of. Okay, so here's what I need, guys. All right. I've got um, I've got seven of the nine. I've got two left. I need a giant and falcon. Jesse Armstead. I was going to say Corey Webster. Corey Webster. Jesse Did Ar Jesse Armstead play for both? Um, I don't know if he played for Thomas the Falcons. Thomas Thomas DeCoe. Corey Webster sounds good. Corey, Corey Webster? Webster there, we, there we're going? Yeah, we need, uh, we need I gotta think about this really Stalter to text me. Yeah, we I'm also need to... a Bronco and Falcon. Bronco and Falcon. I know this will be easy. So here's what we've got already. Bronco and Steeler, Manuel Sanders. Giant and Steeler, Plexico Burris. Ram and Steeler, Jerome Bettis. Ram and Falcon, Ironhead Hayward. Uh, and then 3,000-yard passer, Broncos, Peyton Manning, Giants, Eli Manning. Rams, Kurt Warner. Hmm, that was pretty easy. Uh, Bronco and Falcon. I know there's one there, right there on the top of my head. I'll think of it in a minute. Falcon. Yeah, I can't use Dan Reeves. All right, so <laughs> what, what do we got? Uh, first of all, we have to give away some tickets. Oh, let's Randy. do that. Yeah, we've got uh, your chance to win a four-pack of tickets to next Tuesday night's Budweiser Bash for the Cardinals and A's. The game features a limited edition Gary Gaetti bobblehead. Text in now at 314-399-9646. Yo, ho! And you can win a Budweiser Bash four-pack for the Cardinals versus the A's. And today's question is, what did the Rays, according to Chip Carey, what did the Rays shortstop do to get picked <laughs> off last night from second base? What did he do? Now you can get all the details on the season's series of Budweiser Bash Cardinals games now at cardinals.com slash promotions. Text in and win. What did the Rays shortstop do to get picked off at second base last night, according to Chip Carey? <laughs> By the way, we did get a text, uh, a text response, Randy, mm -hmm. for Giants, Falcons, OCU, Minura. Okay. 
Like it? It's a good one. It's a really good one. As soon as, as soon as the, the texted and he saw it. Um, yep. So yesterday I played some audio of Phil talking with Bryson DeChambeau before their little game. And he, and if you guys remember the clip, uh, he, you know, he asked Bryson, what are we betting? Bryson says, I haven't thought about it. And he goes, what else are you thinking about then if you're not thinking about that? Well, Phil had a response yesterday to the reports about his betting. He says, this is on his Twitter, at Phil Mickelson, or I guess his ex. I never bet on the Ryder Cup. While it was well known that I always enjoyed a friendly wager on the course, I would never undermine the integrity of the game. I've also been very open about my gambling addiction i have previously conveyed my remorse took responsibility i have gotten help have been fully committed to therapy that has been positively impacted me and i feel good about where i am now well played again a man who responded <laughs> to another guy when he asked him i had when he responded with i haven't thought about how we're going to bet on this his response was what else have you been thinking about apparently doing great with his therapy and his gambling addiction integrity of the game is well played that that that's those a good are, line. there are key words key phrases that you must use to really show that you are sincere in what you're speaking of and integrity of the game i would never Disgrace the integrity of the game. That, that, that's top tier. Didn't love the that. gambling guy say, though, that he told Phil, what are you doing, that he wouldn't let Phil bet on the Ryder Cup? Phil, great technicality here. I never bet on the Ryder Cup. Didn't say he didn't try didn't, to. Didn't mean he didn't try to. <laughs> that's a good point. Uh, also, I thought that's this why was, you have to choose those words wisely. Yes. I thought yes. this was great. This, this came out right as Phil was making a statement. Fire Pit Collective, which is a podcast, uh, tweeted out this little uh, bit from the Phil book from CBS announcer Gary McCord, who said that every time Phil would get to my hole when I was in the tower, Bones would look up at me and I would flash the odds. If Phil had a 15-footer, I'd flash three fingers, which meant three to one. If it was a 60-footer, I'd give him two to one on a two-put. Bones would go down and whisper in his ear and Phil would look up at me and shake his head yes or no i cannot tell you how many wadded Whoa. up 20s i threw out of the tower until the tour found out and i got word through cbs that i was no longer allowed to gamble with phil while up in the tower <laughs> that, was wow. from the film, that was from the book phil and former cbs announcer gary mccord That's fantastic wow wow i had never wow. seen that story before I, you, gotta, <laughs> you gotta keep himself engaged and clearly money <laughs> Keeps him engaged in the game. That's fantastic. Uh, sure. I mean, whatever works. That's just uh, some interesting uh, tactics used. I, I need a Netflix. We were talking about Johnny Manziel and his untold Netflix documentary story. I need one on Phil. Oh, ASAP. yeah. Yeah. We definitely yeah, that, that's that. definitely one. And by the way, Carrie, I don't know if you if you felt a weird like itch somewhere that you just can't get to today, Carrie. It's because Mizzou fans all over the place are extremely happy today. As assistant basketball coach uh, C.Y. Young tweeted out the Ali over Frazier, the famous the famous mm -hmm. photo, because it looks like. Mizzou's about to sign another four-star uh, center, Peyton Marshall out of Marietta, Georgia. Mm. is what It's looking like it's tracking right now. 247 has it as 50-50 between then and Auburn, but with the tweet from C.Y. Young, that's usually when Mizzou coaches, uh, we know it's about a done deal. He's a big seven-footer out of Marietta, Georgia, 300 pounds. You ever seen a small seven -footer? That's a fair point. <laughs> and, um, and it's looking like Mizzou right now, already one of the top <laughs> recruiting classes in college basketball for 2024, is going to get another bump to their class. I believe I believe Marshall will make them, would give them the highest rated basketball class they've ever had. Are you, are you shaking in your boots over there, CD? <laughs> December what? 22nd, 23rd? When is Brian Rice? Yeah. You're going to catch a fade. See us then. You're going to catch a fade. It's going to be bad in. for yeah. you. Uh, great job today by our producer, audio engineer, one Matthew Rocky. Have a great trip. Thank you very much. I'm excited for it. You guys say, again? enjoy the show on. Uh, He's going to Denver again. He's got to go going visit to Denver his for the first time. friends. Are you going to Denver again? I am going to Denver. He's going again. to Denver. Yeah, that's a, again. Yeah. Yeah. Not again. You and Uncle Stan? Is he flying oh, you out there? I think he's go. flying him out. Yeah. yeah. Uncle Stan. Stan. Yeah. Tell him we said hi. No, I'm just yeah. I'm going there for a nice him. little long weekend. Uh, you guys get Bradford Bruns on Monday. You're very All lucky right. for that. And I'll be back on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, Brooke, have a lovely weekend. Yes. You got anything going on? Uh, no, not really. Just going to hang out. Good. Hang out with Stevie. Enjoy. Stevie yes. Nicks. Yes. And your fiance. Oh, yeah, him too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm about him. Of course. He's, <laughs> we'll do things. CD. And uh, Franco wandered too far off the bag. Yes. That was the answer to the question. So thank you. Chip is well, great Chip. at dad jokes. Yep. Uh, Danny Mack is in. He's going to provide us with a little balloon party leading up to BK and Ferrario and then the fast lane this afternoon. Watch everything on the YouTube, kids. Just go to YouTube.com and type in 101 ESPN STL for all of us until Monday morning at 7. Have a great weekend, St. Louis. Hey, your face. We want to see your face. Yeah. Who said that? You want to see my